All righty, here we be. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Crossplay Gaming. I'm Eric. If you're new, we are going to get started on a little experiment here. Um, all right, we're going to be playing some Minecraft. It's been a while since I visited the server. I think it's about time I got back to working on my ocean monument emptying project. Um, I have updated the server to 1.20.1. Um, and so, uh, you know, if you know how to get fabric working and, uh, you're able to, do, uh, go to discord and check out the server info and the rules, then, um, feel free to, uh, feel free to, um, join. I could whitelist you, although you got to agree to the rules and all that. Hello over there on kick. It's good to see kick chat integrated with the, um, integrated with the restream chat. So that's cool. See, uh, Jug Draco. How we doing? Good to see ya. Big lurking. All righty. So we're going to be, uh, yeah, we're going to be listening to some theology while we play Minecraft. I got this idea because I was able to g get through just off, off stream. I've been able to get through a lot of books by playing Minecraft and listening at the same time during some kind of uh, monotonous Minecraft tasks. And, um, so, uh, yeah, I found some, I found a public domain website, so I don't have to worry about copyright and I've got Calvin's Institutes in there. So we're going to listen to John Calvin on the Trinity tonight while I work on my ocean monument. That's the plan anyways. And I think I have a working play pause button on my keyboard. Uh, but first let's jump over to Minecraft. I'll make, gotta make sure it's all working and stuff. Here we go. All right. It was working. <laughs> no reason for it not to work, but, uh, yeah. So because I just upgraded to, or updated to, uh, 1.20.1, um, a lot of the mods I usually use haven't been released, uh, for the newest version. So I'm not going to have any shaders or texture packs on. Um, although if people join, I do have proximity voice chat working cause that, Although they'll have to upgrade their version of that. I have yet to really have a long successful stream with like proximity voice chat working. But let's open the game. And uh, once I'm in the game, I'll, I'll start playing the book. Um, so this portion of the Institutes is book one, chapter 13, I believe. Um it's where he dive. He's just refuted a uh, pagan idolatry, basically, sort of as a concept. And now he's jumping into what the actual god is. And uh, so let me just see if I hit play if it works. Chapter thirteen. There it goes. One divine essence containing three persons taught in the scriptures from the beginning. And I can just pause it whenever I want. So I might like pause it here and there and comment because this is an older translation. That's why it's public domain. And so. It's almost like listening to a King James Bible because it's so, some of the language is so old or uh, academic. So we'll see how it goes. What is taught in the scriptures concerning the immensity and spirituality of the essence of God should serve not go. only to overthrow the foolish notions of the vulgar, but also the to vulgar. refute the subtleties of profane philosophy. One of the ancients, in his own conception, very shrewdly said that whatever we see and whatever we do not see is God. But he imagined... And you could tell with some of the pronunciation I find as I'm listening to this, um, like it's public domain, which means they have like volunteers read the books. Um, and so like some of the language, they mispronounce some of the words, uh, I think. But this guy's British, so even if he does, it sounds smart. So, you know. Had to go with this one. There was another version, but it was a little harder to listen to. It's not uh, always the mo highest quality reading, but this one, this one was pretty good. Uh, can we hit play? It was working. That the deity was diffused through every part of the world. But although God, to keep us within the bounds of sobriety, speaks but rarely of his essence, yet by those two attributes which I have mentioned, he supersedes all gross imaginations and represses the presumption of the human mind. Hmm. For surely his immensity ought to inspire us with awe that we may not attempt to measure him with our senses, 
and the spirituality of his nature prohibits us from entertaining any earthly or carnal speculations concerning him. For the same reason he represents his residence to be in heaven, for though, as he is incomprehensible, he fills the earth also, yet seeing that our minds from their dullness are continually dwelling on the earth, in order to shake off our sloth and inactivity, he properly raises us above the world. And here is demonstrated the error of the Manichees, who, by maintaining the existence of two original principles, made the devil, as it were, equal to God. The Manichees. This um, certainly was both. The Manichees. I'm trying to remember, heard about that in seminary, but, uh, yeah, he's going to talk about the error of the Manichees, um, where it's more, well, from what he's describing, it sounds like it's more dualistic, where uh, they, yeah, they make sort of God and the devil equivalent rather than God being the creator of all things and the devil being a fallen Dividing angel. Dividing the unity of God and limiting his immensity. For their daring to abuse certain testimonies of scripture betrayed a shameful ignorance, as the error itself evidenced an execrable madness. Execrable. The anthropomorphites execrable. also, who imagined God to be corporeal, because the scripture frequently ascribes to him a mouth, ears, eyes. Uh, okay, so he's basically saying, like, one of the errors is that <clears throat> they see the sort of human-sounding language described to God, like in the Old Testament, like where the angel of the Lord appears, and um, they take that as seeing God as corporeal, corporeal, I think is the word uh, that he just used, but basically makes God actually more human and finite. In other words, they take those passages as a denial of God's um, eternal attributes. Mm -hmm. My play button doesn't always work. Oh, it seems Hands to. And feet oh, are easily... uh, the play button works when I'm not in the menu. That's funny. Refuted. For who, even of the meanest capacity, understands not that God lisps, as it were, with us, just as nurses are accustomed to speak to infants. Wherefore, such forms of expression do not clearly explain the nature of God, but accommodate the knowledge of him to our narrow capacity, to accomplish right. which the scripture must necessarily descend far below the height of his majesty. Right, so he's basically but saying... He also so he's basically saying that God... Well, that, that's a common phrase that I've used in quoting him, that God lisps for our benefit, in other words, like you make baby talk when you talk to a child. God presenting himself in these human sort of appearances in the Old Testament is not a full declaration of his nature. But common theological term for it is it's a, I believe it's a, an anthropomorphism. Whoop. What was that? Why does the play button just decide not to work sometimes? It's himself by another peculiar character by which he may be yet more clearly distinguished. For, while he declares himself to be but one, he proposes himself to be distinctly considered in three persons, without apprehending which, we have only a bare and empty name of God floating in our brains, without any idea of the true God. Now that no one may vainly dream of three gods, or suppose that the simple essence of God is divided among the three persons, we must seek for a short and easy definition which will preserve us from all error. But since some violently object to the word person, as of human invention, we must first examine the reasonableness of this objection. When the Apostle denominates the Son the express image of the hypostasis of the Father... Yeah, that's he... another sort of a mispronunciation, I think. He says hypostasis. I think the term is hypostasis. I don't know. Maybe it doesn't matter. But, um... Okay, so he's talking about how the distinction... Hey, Peter C., how are we doing? He's talking about the distinction... Yeah, it's the common terminology in Trinitarian theology, is the distinction of the persons without dividing the substance of God. Undoubtedly ascribes to the Father some subsistence in which he differs from the Son. For to understand this word as synonymous with essence, as some interpreters have done, as though Christ, like wax impressed with a seal, represented in himself the substance of the Father, were not only harsh but also absurd. For the essence of God, being simple and indivisible, he who contains all in himself, not in part or by derivation, but in complete perfection, could not without impropriety or even absurdity be called the express image of it. But since the Father, although distinguished by his own peculiar property, hath expressed himself entirely in his Son, 
It is with the greatest reason asserted that he hath made his hypostasis conspicuous in him, with which the other appellation, given him in the same passage, of the brightness of his glory, exactly corresponds. I do wish I could use my uh, apostle, we audible translation to listen to this, but proper I could get a uh, which is conspicuous. I could end son. up getting a copyright strike. And then so also we easily infer we'll go with the, the older of the Alan son, translation. which distinguishes him from the father. The same reasoning is applicable to the Holy Spirit, for we shall soon prove him also to be God, and yet he must of necessity be considered as distinct from the father. But this is not a distinction of the essence, which it is unlawful to represent as any other than simple and undivided. Unlawful. It follows, therefore, if the testimony of the apostle be credited, that there are in God three hypostases. And as the Latins have expressed the same thing by the word person, it is too fastidious and obstinate to contend about so clear a matter. If we wish to translate word for word, we may call it subsistence. Subsist Many, in the same sense, have called it substance. Nor has the word person been used by the Latins only, but the Greeks also, for the sake of testifying their consent to this doctrine, taught the existence of three prosopa, persons, in God. Mm -hmm. But both Greeks and Latins, notwithstanding any verbal difference, are in perfect harmony respecting the doctrine itself. Now, though heretics rail at the word person, or oh, some five, three, six. Gotcha. men clamorously refuse to admit a name of human invention, since they cannot make us assert that there are three each of whom is entirely God, nor yet that there are more gods than one. How very unreasonable is it to reprobate words which express nothing but what is testified and recorded in the Scriptures. It were better, say they, to restrain not only our thoughts, but our expressions also within the limits of the Scripture, than to introduce exotic words which may generate <laughs> future dissensions and disputes. For thus we... So I think what he's about to say, he's basically talking about the objection people use where they say, well, we should only limit... Like the word Trinity is not in the Bible. And so people say, well, we should limit our vocabulary to scriptural words. And I think what he's about to point out is the hypocrisy of that. In that once you start explaining the Bible, what that means is you're using vocabulary that's not necessarily in the Bible. That doesn't mean it's unbiblical. It just means you're using, you know, uh, more explicit vocabulary. Um, and so let's see how he lines it up. Come on. ourselves with verbal controversies thus the truth is lost in altercation thus charity expires in odious contention if they call yeah. every word exotic which cannot be found in the scriptures in so many syllables they impose on us a law which is very unreasonable and which condemns all interpretation condemns but what is all composed interpretation of detached right. texts of scripture connected together but if by exotic they mean that which is curiously contrived and superstitiously defended which tends to contention more than to edification, there we go. the use of which is either unseasonable or unprofitable, which offends pious ears with its harshness and seduces persons from the simplicity of the divine word, I most cordially embrace their modest opinion. For I think that we ought to speak of God with the same religious caution which should govern our thoughts of him, since all the thoughts that we entertain concerning him merely from ourselves are foolish, and all our expressions absurd. But there is a proper medium to be observed. We should seek in the scriptures a certain rule, both for thinking and for speaking, by which we may regulate all the thoughts of our minds and all the words of our mouth. Right, so we're saying we should, as much as we can, be regulated by scripture and how we develop our vocabulary. And so, like, they have a point, um, but there's a balance to it. You know. But what forbids our expressing, in plainer words, those things which in the scriptures are, to our understanding, intricate and obscure, provided our expressions religiously and faithfully convey the true sense of the scripture, and are used with modest caution, and not without sufficient occasion. Of this, examples sufficiently numerous are not wanting. But when it shall have been proved that the church was absolutely necessitated to use the terms trinity and persons, if any one then censures the novelty of the words, may he not be justly considered as offended at the light of the truth, <laughs> as having no other cause of censure but that the truth is explained and elucidated. But such verbal novelty, if it must have this right, wing ding thing, is principally used when the truth and we're is frozen. to be inserted in opposition to malicious cavillers. Was lovely, huh? Well, by good to see you. Well, I, looking over, I noticed my camera's frozen, so in give me a second. Day, we find great difficulty in refuting the enemies of pure and sound doctrine. Possessed of serpentine lubricity, they escape by the most artful expedients, 
unless they are vigorously pursued and held fast when once caught. Uh. Thus the ancients, pestered with various controversies against erroneous dogmas, were constrained to express their sentiments with the utmost perspicuity. Hey, Lulu, come on, how's it going? Fugitives to the empire. Yeah, they got old camera freeze. It's been happening. I don't get it. It's only happened since I got this new camera. Errors. Unable to resist the clear testimonies of the scriptures, Arius confessed Christ to be God and the Son of God. And as though this were all Arius. that was necessary, he pretended to agree with the church at large. Oh, but at the same. Oh, I think he's got a great quote coming up here. If this is the part that I remember, but he's talking about the Arian heresy, where he'll use vocabulary to, um, Arius would use vocabulary similar to Trinitarians, but then would subordinate Christ. Uh, am I a Calvinist? I am, although we're not listening to the parts of the institutes that are, um, specific to Calvin. It's Calvin, but he's talking about the Trinity, which he shares his theology with all Christians on. And so we're not getting that specific tonight. Maybe some other night. <laughs> yeah, his arguments for the Trinity are excellent. People people think like the Institutes are all about predestination or something, but they're not. They're like a really robust defense of the faith. Time he continued to maintain that Christ was created and had mm -hmm. a beginning like other creatures. To draw the versatile subtlety of this man from its concealment, mm -hmm. the ancient fathers proceeded further mm -hmm. and declared Christ to be the eternal son of the Father and consubstantial with the Father. Here, the impiety openly discovered itself when the Arians began inveterately to hate and execrate the name Omoousios, consubstantial. But if in the first instance they had sincerely and cordially confessed Christ to be God, they would not have denied him to be consubstantial with the Father. Who can dare to censure those good men as quarrelsome and contentious for having kindled such a flame of controversy and disturbed the peace of the church on account of one little word? That little word distinguished Christians who held the pure faith from sacrilegious Arians. Mm. Afterwards arose Sibelius, who considered the names of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as little more than empty sounds, arguing that they were not... Yes, Sibelius, his, his error was modalism, basically, is the modern version of Sibelianism but it's another denial of the Trinity. So he talked about Arians. They would talk about uh, consubstantial was the word they would use, but they would like, they would like complain that Christians of the day were using really specific vocabulary to define the Trinity, but they would hide behind the vagueness uh, and actually change definitions. And so now he's talking about Sabellians who uh, deny the, the distinction of the persons within the one being of God. Um, yeah, so let's see what he says about them. Come on. On account of any real distinction, but were different attributes of God, whose attributes of this kind are numerous. If the point came to be controverted, he confessed that he believed the Father to be God, the Son God, and the Holy Spirit God, but he would readily evade all the force of this confession by adding that he had said no other than if he had called God potent and just and wise. Uh, and thus he came clever. to another conclusion, that the Father is the Son and that the Holy Spirit is the Father, without any order or distinction. The good doctors of that age, who had the interest of religion at heart, in order to counteract the wickedness of this man, maintained, on the contrary, that they ought really to acknowledge three peculiar He's like, sure, I believe in the God, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, kind of like I believe in different attributes of God. Subtleties. By the plain and simple truth, but they affirm that they the truly subsisted the in one God, or what is the same, that in the unity of God there subsisted a trinity of persons. If then the words have not been rashly invented, we should beware lest we be convicted of fastidious temerity in rejecting them. I could wish that we need to be buried in oblivion. Yeah, I'd say they're basically the same thing from what I understand, Dragon. That the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit oh, are the one God, here. and that nevertheless the Son is not the Father, nor the Spirit the Son, but that they are distinguished from each other by some peculiar property. I am not so rigidly precise as to be fond of contending for mere words, for I observe that the ancients, who otherwise speak on these subjects with great piety, are not consistent with each other, nor in all cases with themselves. For what forms of expression adopted by councils does Hilary excuse? To what extremes does Augustine sometimes proceed? How different are the Greeks from the Latins? But of this variation let one example suffice. When the Latins would translate the word homoousios, they called it consubstantial, signifying the substance of the Father, 
and the sun it's should really be hard one. to empty out and thus these using hallways because they're so deep. For essence. Quince also Jerome, writing to Damasus, pronounces it to be sacrilege to say that there are three substances in God. Yet that there are three substances in God you will find asserted in Hilary more than a hundred times. Uh -huh. But how perplexed is Jerome on the word hypostasis, for he suspects some latent poison in the assertion that there are three hypostases in God. And if anyone uses this word in a pious sense, he refrains not from calling it an improper expression. If indeed he was sincere in this declaration and did not rather knowingly and willfully endeavour to asperse, with a groundless calumny, the bishops of the East whom he hated, he certainly discovers not much ingeniousness in affirming that in all the profane schools, usia, essence, is the same as hypostasis, hypostasis, which the trite and common use of the words universally contradicts. More modesty and liberality are discovered Proud, by Augustine, awkward. How are we doing? We are who, listening to Calvin's Institutes. In this sense, is new to Latin ears, yet leaves the Greeks their mm -hmm. usual phraseology and even peaceably tolerates. He's talking the about the doctrine of the Trinity, and uh, he's and kind of walking through the history of the sixth uh, book debates of his about it. history seems to imply that it was by ignorant men that it had first been improperly applied to this subject. The same Hillary accuses the heretics Am I of religious? great crime you could probably in constraining say that. <laughs> him by their wickedness to expose to the danger of human language those things which ought to be confined within the religion of the mind, plainly avowing that this is to do things unlawful, to express things inexpressible, to assume things not conceited. A little after, he largely excuses himself for his boldness in bringing forward new terms, for when he had used the names of nature, father, son, and spirit, he immediately adds that whatever is sought further is beyond the signification of language, beyond the reach of our senses, beyond the conception of our understanding. And in another place he pronounces that happy were the bishops of Gaul, who had neither composed nor received nor even Oh, it's known not personal at all. I put it all over the channel. <laughs> ancient and very simple <laughs> no, I'm, one, I'm a Christian. Which had been received in all the churches from the days of the apostles. Whoop. Very similar is the excuse of Augustine. But I like reading theology and stuff, so I, I usually do this like off stream. So if I'm playing Minecraft, I'll listen to books and stuff. So I figured, why not do it on stream? But to avoid passing it over in total silence, that the Father, Son, and Spirit. Yeah, this is like public free. domain, and so it's like this an older translation. So the English is pretty old. Because this was originally in French. It's John Calvin. Subscribe to expressions adopted by us, provided they are not actuated by pride, perverseness, or disingenuous subtlety. But let them also, on the other hand, consider the great necessity which constrains us to use such language that by degrees they here, may actually. at I'm length be accustomed to a useful phraseology. Let them also learn to beware, since we have to oppose the Arians on the one side and the Sabellians on the other, lest, while they take offence at both these parties being deprived of all opportunity of evasion, they cause some suspicion that they are themselves the disciples either of Arius or of Sabellius. Oh, gotcha, Arius proud, confesses awkward. that Christ is God but maintains also that he was created and had a beginning. He acknowledges that Christ is one with the Father, but secretly whispers in the ears of his disciples that he is united to him like the rest of the faithful, though by a singular pri Well, you're jumping in the deep end if you join with uh, some Calvin's Institutes, but um, yeah, I mean, as a Christian, I of course would recommend Christianity. But, and I mean, I'm a Protestant to be more specific, and so... Um, I don't know. If you're curious, I can answer questions to the best of my ability. I mean, I did go to school for theology, so I know, I guess I know a thing or two, but. <laughs> can I give you some advice? Boy. Um, well, I mean, we tend to base our, based on my beliefs. I mean, we tend to base, try to base our knowledge of as Protestants in particular, we try to base our knowledge of what we believe and know about God on Scripture. And so, I mean, if you want to just go to the source material and read some things, I mean, yeah, that is a big question. I'd recommend, like, if you want to just read Scripture, it's tough at first because it's like, there's a whole, I mean, it's written over thousands of years. But if you want to get to, like, the basics, um, the Gospel of John is very good in introducing the life of Christ. Um, and who he is. And then like the book of Romans, like John is like, uh, John is like the first gospel that was really written like to Gentiles. It's generally believed, meaning not people who are not Jewish, uh, people like us, basically. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if you're Jewish or not, but, um, uh, but people outside of 
Israel. Um, in your words, what makes me a Christian? Yeah. So in terms of advice, um, yeah. So I'll, I'll tell you sort of the source of what I'm about to say, and then I'll say what makes me a Christian in my mind. Um, but I'd recommend the gospel of John to explain some of this. And then that's sort of the life of Christ. And then Romans is sort of the theology explaining you're Norwegian. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So according to biblical terminology, you're a Gentile like me, you know, but, uh, <laughs> um, but basically the belief, my belief is that, I mean, God created the world. Um, and that very shortly thereafter, we basically fell and rebelled against him. And so that's basically infected every human being ever since. And, um, and so Christ is sort of the solution to that. And so Christ is believed to be what we're listening to tonight is the doctrine of the Trinity, but Christians believe that God exists in Trinity, that he's one being, but he shares that being with three divine persons. When we say persons, that's a theological word. It, it doesn't mean um, three human persons, but it's three, like some have said, centers of consciousness, that there's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So God sent his Son into the world, um, and Christ took on a human nature. Hello. Hey. Looks like we got a sub. I'll let the horn finish. Yeah, so Christ took on a human nature. And so basically he obeyed all of the, the laws of God that we broke. And then uh, he, by dying on the cross, he took the punishment for our sin for having broken those laws. And so um, scripture basically puts it that if we believe in him, then basically who Christ is and what he did that's credited to us. It's called like the, the, the academic doctrinal term for that is forensic justification to be complicated, but it's not that complicated. It basically means that if you believe in Christ, then when God looks at you, he sees you as being just as righteous as Christ because the punishment that we would have received from God has been paid and the righteousness that Christ lived in, like that's counted as, as if we had done it. Um, and then as a result of that, we have peace with God. And then we walk according to God's ways, not out of fear of him, but out of, you know, out of love for him the way it was supposed to be from the beginning. And so basically if you have faith in Christ, who he is and what he did in that way, that's Christianity to me. Um, and so that's my nutshell explanation of Christianity, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, so, I don't know, did that make sense? <laughs> Sorry about the errors. Oh, I didn't really see it. But... <clears throat> I don't know. That's my nutshell explanation, but I'm happy to go back and revisit anything I said, because that's, like, a lot at once. <clears throat> Automod blocked you? Oh. Yeah, it's, it's set to, like, super sensitive right now. I... Probably more sensitive than I want it to be, but I don't know. I, I could go in there and try to tweak it, but feel free to reword whatever you said to make it work. Boop, boop, boop. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah, it's really hard to get this water out of here, and I only have 28 sponges, so this could be annoying. So I'll play the audio again, and then if you have questions, I'll answer them. Mm -mm. Explain it better than you ever could. Well, that's good. <laughs> I hope it was relatively clear. Say that he is consubstantial. You did reword tear it. Tear off the mask from the hypocrite. All right, let me let me go over to Twitch. Actually, uh, I'm gonna switch the sensitivity. Man, I don't want that to be Twitch. I should probably do it like this. Twitch. That TV. Okay, there we go. Um, so yeah, give me one second here. Why is my keypad being so annoying? Hey, no one's offended. Trust me, I'm glad to, glad to get the questions. How does this stream work? Oh, well, I was listening to Calvin, but then we got some good questions, so I paused that. I'll probably get back to it shortly. 
I'm just tweaking the uh, fil the the chat mod settings on Twitch, um, because they're probably like really sensitive to dumb stuff. Let me see. Sup, Trainer Mystic. <clears throat> Let me see here. Uh, stream manager. My chat. Let's see here. Um. Where, let's see here. There should be some settings I can switch. Hopefully. Y'all can't see what I'm doing, but... This has been a problem. I don't get a ton of Twitch viewers, so I haven't messed with this in a while. Chat highlight, okay. Um, oh wait, here we go. Manage moderation settings. That's probably what we want. Um, okay, it's on level 4. So, uh-oh. I'm probably about to get damaged. Hold on. <laughs> Hold on a second. Let me go over to Minecraft again and get safe. Because I've probably got... Yeah, I've got a thing after me. we got to get into a safe spot. There we go. All right. Hey, Black Ninja, how we doing? Yeah, good. we got some people showing up. This is good. Just let me finish tweaking this. Because this is at, like, super sensitive moderation. Some moderation, a little moderation. Okay, I'll turn it off for now, unless people misbehave. All right, so you should have an easier time chatting now. It says that there's already a baseline level of moderation Twitch always does, it's saying, but I turned off the hypersensitivity. No power for three days. Hot dang. All right, so I'm going to play the audio again, read the chat, and uh, is this a public server? Hey, Jaden Berger, how are we doing? Um, it is, well, you'd have to go over to my discord. Actually, I tried to do it before it wouldn't work. All right. Here comes the link to my discord. So you can see all the rules for the server. Um, you have to get fabric working. And if you know how to do that, it's version 1.20.1 on Java. So you have to have all that and agree to the rules on discord. And then I could whitelist you. <clears throat> To an extent, yes, but no is the answer. Uh, yeah, it's not like a totally open server, but yeah, I do whitelist people pretty freely if they agree to the rules. It takes a little bit of a process, though, because you got to know how to install this version and all that. <clears throat> Did he fail in dying for our sins? Well, d it depends what you mean by dying for our sins in terms of what you think that means. Um, basically, we don't believe the process of him ending all sin actually existing actually is finished in that sense, in that he's slowly, he is slowly overcoming sin in the world. There's that, although there's, there's theological difference as to how he's doing it, the timing of it and all of that. But what we mean in the immediate sense is that he took on the punishment for your sin if you believe in him. So that is done. But the process in which it actually comes out of our lives and that we change, that's the process of the Christian life. We call it sanctification in the theological sense. Yeah, forgiving us and helping us be better. Um, yeah, he forgives us. Yeah, he forgives us so that we, are, we have peace with God. And then we go on that journey of sanctification as a process. Um, you think we failed him rather. Oh, is that what you're saying? Could you override the 10 minutes to message? Is that a thing on YouTube or is that on, uh, Twitch? But Christ is not God. Christ is God. That is the Trinitarian doctrine. Yes, we failed him. Ah, well, yes, we did fail, but he's, but the point, this is why it's forensic justification. This is why it's substitutionary atonement in that. Out of love, he he represents us in that God counts his righteousness to us so that we failed, but he didn't. That's what it means. Um, error code 7739 is your user. Uh, error core. Is there a 10-minute timer on uh, Twitch? I mean, you're, you're chatting there, but... Um, let's see here. Why do we why do I believe Christ is God? 
Well, there's a multiple ways you could answer that. Um, I could believe in terms of what is the source of that information for me. There's that answer, and then there's like whether or not it's been proven is another answer. So I believe like if you're asking where the Bible says that, there's a lot of that in the Book of John. That I I'd say the Book of John is one of the strongest books where you really see that language used of Christ. Um, uh, and so in terms of where I would say you can read that kind of thing, that's one of them. And then why I believe it, I'd say he proved his claims by rising from the dead. And there's lots of evidence for that. Um, that's like, there's like, yeah. So there's like two conversations we could have. There's like the apologetics discussion, meaning like the defense of the faith, like the, the reasons why you should believe that. And then there's the discussion of like, just where does the Bible say that? Um, it depends which question you're asking is which one I would answer, but. <clears throat> yeah, this is like, uh, this is a slow process. Yeah, you, you don't do this right, and it refills itself, so you gotta go, like, up here. Here we go. Got 15 left. Got some fallen from up here. Oops. Wrong. We scrolled away. Whoop. Faith isn't easy to earn. Oh, did you mean learn? Yeah. Well, we're, since we're talking about uh, Calvin tonight, I have some words about that. One second here. Um, but let me just make sure I'm in a good spot in this game <laughs> so I can can I whitelist a sprinkle skate 11 so if I'm gonna I'm probably not gonna whitelist anyone at this very moment because I'm trying to finish this little area hold on burr, 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 burr. here we go mean squared error join the game hey how are we doing mean squared error all right, we're out of sponges, and we, like, wasted a lot of them trying to empty this. But, uh, Ace Sprinkle Skate, um, you don't play games anymore? Oh, okay. Jaden Berger, uh, okay, so Jaden Berger, did you join the, uh, Discord server and read all the rules and stuff? I can probably get to whitelisting you eventually, as long as you're cool with everything. But you were talking about faith, um... Christians differ in how they interpret scripture on this matter, but the way one of the things about faith is that you could say it's hard, but at the same time, I think scripture describes it as something that God gives you. So there is a supernatural aspect to it, I think. Um, do you think acknowledging the doctrine of the Trinity is required for salvation? I would uh, be a little nuanced about it. I think a lot of people become Christians without fully understanding the doctrine. Um, that's something you, there's a lot of ways you grow throughout the Christian life. And so like, do you have to have a perfect understanding immediately? I, I don't think so, but there are certain like aspects of it. You naturally like kind of have to accept to, for the Christian message to make sense, but you might still not might fully get it, but it's, it would be different for me to, if you asked me about like, teachers out there who actively fight against it. That's another question. There's like, we were just listening to Calvin talking about the Trinity. Um, and he's talking about like the Arians and the Sabellians who were willfully subverting the doctrine. They were not Christians, I don't think. There's like a willfulness there, even in the face of like clear biblical teaching. That's a different matter. Um, yeah. Uh, you should buy a Bible. Absolutely. Well, hey, if you have a smartphone, just look up my recommendation in terms of translation. I have the ESV app on mine. So you can just for free download the ESV app on your phone. And you got the whole thing right there. And it's easy to search through. Um, but yeah. What do you think about the concept of a Pope? I don't know how I feel about it yet, to be honest. Well, I'm a Protestant, like I was saying before. Uh, we're listening to Calvin's Institutes. He probably has a whole section on it, honestly, arguing against the idea. 
but um, yeah, I'm very much a Protestant, and so I don't, I wouldn't believe in the concept myself, um, because I think there's there's a whole theology along with it about the history of like a supposed succession from the apostles, the the nature of his authority. I think overrules um, overrules scripture in a lot of ways that I think scripture itself would not be in favor of. But that's a huge discussion about the the nature of the Protestant Reforma Reformation and all that. Um, want pages? I think it's better. No temptation to go on an app or watch some series or do some other stuff. Yeah, I mean it's not hard to get your hands on a Bible. You can get a cheap one online. But I'm just saying, if you want like access right now, it's not hard. But uh, yeah, there's benefits to a physical Bible. <clears throat> I think uh, Mean Squared Air is trying to help me finish finish my thing here. All right, so I will play the audio again, and uh, but if there, yeah, no problem. Feel free to stick around, ask more questions, or listen to the listen to the institutes. Yet you add nothing to the scriptures. Sibelius asserts that the names Father, Son, and Spirit are expressive of no distinction in the Godhead. Say that they are three, and he will exclaim that you are talking of three gods. Say that in the one essence of God there is a trinity of persons, and you will at once express what the scriptures declare, and will restrain such frivolous loquacity. Now, if any persons are prevented by such excessive scrupulousness from admitting these terms, yet not one of them can deny that when the scriptures speak of one God, it should be understood of a unity of substance, uh, and that when it speaks of three in one essence, it denotes here. the persons in this trinity. No, no. When I this am. is honestly confessed, we have no further concern about words. But I have found, by long and frequent experience, that those who pertinaciously contend about words cherish some latent poison, so that it were better designedly to provoke their resentment than to use obscure language for the sake of obtaining their favour. But, leaving the dispute about terms, I shall now enter on the discussion of the subject itself. What I denominate a person is a subsistence in the divine essence, which is related to the others and yet distinguished from them by an incommunicable property. By the word subsistence we mean something different from the word essence. For if the word were simply God and had no peculiar property, John had been guilty of impropriety in saying that he was well, I just always got an audio book God. going. When he immediately adds that the word oh, hold also on. was God, he reminds Working us on of the baby unity to sleep. of hold the on. essence. But because he could not be with God without subsisting in the Father, hence arises that subsistence which, although inseparably connected with the essence, has a peculiar mark by which it is distinguished from it. Now I say that each of the three subsistences has a relation to the others, but is distinguished from them by a peculiar property. We particularly use the word relation, or comparison here, because when mention is made simply and indefinitely right. of God, this name pertains no less to the Son and Spirit than to the Father. But whenever the Father is compared with the Son, the property peculiar to each distinguishes him from the other. All right, looks like we have some success. Thirdly, whatever is proper to each of them, I assert to be incommunicable, because whatever is ascribed to the Father as a character of distinction cannot be applied or transferred to the Son. Nor indeed do I disapprove oh, of working. the definition of Tertullian, if rightly understood, that there is in God a certain distribution or economy which makes no change in the unity of the essence. But before I proceed any further, I must prove the deity of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, oh, after right. which we shall see He's how going to they prove the deity of the Son and the Holy Spirit. When the scripture speaks of the word of God, it certainly were very absurd to imagine it to be only a transient and momentary sound emitted into the air, and coming forth from God himself, of which nature were the oracles given to the fathers and all the prophecies. It oh, is rather to be understood easily, of the eternal actually. wisdom residing in God, whence the oracles and all the prophecies proceeded. For, according to the testimony of Peter, the ancient prophets spake by the Spirit of Christ no less than the apostles and all the succeeding ministers of the heavenly doctrine. But, as Christ had not yet been manifested, we must necessarily understand that the Word was begotten of the Father before the world began. And if the Spirit that inspired the prophets was the Spirit of the Word, we conclude beyond all doubt that the Word was truly God. There we go. And this is taught by Moses with sufficient perspicuity in the creation of the world, 
in which he represents the word as acting such a conspicuous part. For why does he relate that God, in the creation of each of his works, said, Let this or that be done, but that the unsearchable glory of God may resplendently appear in his image? Captious and loquacious men hmm. would readily evade this argument by saying that the word imports an order or command. But the apostles are better interpreters who declare that the worlds were created by the Son and that he upholds all you things just by type the word in the of text his power. Here. For here we see that the word intends the nod or mandate of the Son, who is himself the eternal and essential Son of the Father. Nor to the wise and sober is there any obscurity in that passage of Solomon where he introduces wisdom as begotten of the Father before time began, and presiding at the creation of the world and over all the works of God. For to pretend that this denotes some temporary extension of the will of God were foolish and frivolous, whereas God the then year. intended to discover his fixed and eternal counsel, and even something more secret. To the same purpose also is that assertion of Christ, My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. For by affirming that from the beginning of the world he had continually cooperated with the Father, I should put he on makes my a more here. explicit <laughs> declaration of what had been briefly glanced at by Moses. Listening to Calvin. <laughs> we conclude, therefore, that God spake thus at the creation, that the Word might have his part in the work, and so that operation be common to both. But John sponges? speaks more clearly than all others when he represents the Word, who from the beginning was with God, as in union with the Father, go get the original sponges. cause of all things. This is the word, not a realm a server. Real and this is essence, one with a couple nods on some it. some peculiar property and plainly shows how God, by speaking, created it's in Java the world. edition. Therefore, as all divine revelations are justly entitled the Word of God, so we ought chiefly to esteem that substantial Word, the source of all revelations, who is liable to no variation, who remains with God perpetually one and the same, and who is God himself. Here we are interrupted by some clamorous objectors, who, since they cannot openly rob him of his divinity, secretly steal from him his eternity. For they say that the word only began to exist when God opened his sacred mouth in the creation of the world. But they are too inconsiderate in imagining something new in the substance of God. For as those names of God which relate to his external works began to be ascribed to him after the existence of those works, as when he is called the creator of heaven and earth, so piety neither acknowledges nor admits any name, signifying that God has found anything new to happen to himself. For could anything from any quarter affect a change in him, it would contradict the assertion of James that every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness or shadow of turning. Nothing there is more intolerable than to suppose oh, really? a beginning of that word which was always God, and afterwards the creator of the world. But they argue in their own apprehension most acutely that Moses, by representing God as having then spoken for the first time, implies also nice. that there was no word in him before, than which nothing is more absurd. For it is not to be concluded, because anything begins to be manifested at a certain time, that it had no prior existence. I form a very different conclusion, that since in the very instant when God said, Let there be light, the power of the word was clearly manifested, the word must have existed long before. But if anyone inquires how long, he will find no beginning, for he limits no certain period of time when he himself says, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before nice. the world was. Clear that out quick. Nor is this omitted by John, for before he descends to the creation of the world, he declares that the word was in the beginning with God. We therefore conclude, again, that the word conceived of God before time began, perpetually remained with him, which proves his eternity, his true essence, and his divinity. Though I avert not yet to the person of the mediator, but defer it to that part of the work which will relate to redemption, yet since it ought without controversy to be believed by all that Christ is the very same word clothed in flesh, any testimonies which assert the deity of Christ nice. will be very properly introduced here. When it is said in the 45th Psalm, Thy throne, O God, is for ever and ever, the out. Jews endeavor to evade its force by pleading that the name Elohim is applicable also to angels and to men of dignity and power. But there cannot be found in the scripture a similar passage which erects an eternal throne for a creature, for he is not merely called God, but is also declared to possess an eternal dominion. Besides, this title is never given to a creature without some addition as when it is said that Moses should be a god to Pharaoh. 
Some read it in the genitive I'm trying to think case, if there's any point where I should pause and comment on some of which this, is extremely but I'm trying. <laughs> the older translations make it hard to follow myself. So. singularly excellent is frequently called divine, mm. but it sufficiently appears from the context that such a meaning would be uncouth and forced and totally inapplicable here. But if their perverseness refused to yield this point, there certainly is no obscurity in Isaiah, where he introduces Christ as God and is crowned with supreme power, which is the prerogative of God alone. His name, says he, shall be called the mighty God, the Father of eternity, etc. Here also the Jews object and invert the reading of the passage in this manner. This is the name by which the mighty God, the Father of eternity, shall call him, etc. So that they would leave the Son only the title of Prince of Peace. But to what purpose would so many epithets be accumulated in this passage on God the Father, when the design of the prophet is to distinguish Christ by such eminent characters as may establish our faith in him. Wherefore, there can be no doubt that he is there denominated the mighty God, just as, a little before, he is called Emmanuel. But nothing can be required plainer than a passage in Jeremiah, that this should be the name whereby the branch of David shall be called Jehovah our Righteousness. Nice. For since the Jews themselves teach that all other names of God are mere epithets, are we but that this We're alone, close. which they call ineffable, we is a proper name expressive of his essence, we conclude that the Son is the one eternal God who declares in another place that he will not give his glory to another. This also they endeavor to evade because Moses imposed this name on an altar which he built, and Ezekiel on the city of the new oh, Jerusalem. Got some more over here. But who does not perceive that the altar was erected as a monument of Moses, having been exalted by God? Ooh, we didn't get this room yet. Jerusalem is honored oh, geez, with the is name of God rough. only as a testimony of the divine presence. For thus speaks the prophet, the name of the city shall be Jehovah is there. But Moses expresses himself thus. He built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nissi, my exaltation. But there is more contention about another passage of Jeremiah where the same title is given to Jerusalem in these words. This is the name wherewith she shall be called, Jehovah our righteousness. But this testimony is so far from opposing the truth which we are defending, that it rather confirms it. For, having before testified that Christ is the true Jehovah from whom righteousness proceeds, he now pronounces that the church oh, will have such a clear apprehension of it as to be able to glory in the same name. In the former place, then, is shown the original cause of righteousness, in the latter the go. effect. Now, if these things do not satisfy the Jews, I see not by what cavils they can evade the accounts of Jehovah, having so frequently appeared in the character of an angel. An angel is said to have appeared to the Holy Fathers. Oops, he claims for himself the, the name of the Eternal God. If it be objected that this is spoken with regard to the character which he sustains, this by no means removes the difficulty. For a servant would never rob God of his honor by permitting sacrifice to be offered to himself. But the angel, refusing to eat bread, commands a sacrifice to be offered to Jehovah. He afterwards demonstrates that he is really Jehovah himself. Therefore Manoah and his wife conclude from this evidence that they have seen not a mere angel, but God himself. Hence he says, we shall so, surely die. So I think that he's actually making some Old Testament arguments that are very interesting, and in that he's um, arguing for the deity of Christ by pointing out uh, Christ, what are often called Christophanies, what he believes are... Um, appearances of Christ in the Old Testament sort of as the angel of the Lord. Um, so this is interesting. He's talking about the appearances to Abraham. Because we have seen God. When his wife replies, if the Lord were pleased to kill us, he would not have received a sacrifice at our hands. She clearly acknowledges him to be God, who before is called an angel. Moreover, the reply of the angel himself removes every doubt. Why askest thou after my name, seeing it is wonderful? So much the more detestable is the impiety at? of Servetus in asserting that God never appeared to Abraham and the other patriarchs, but that they worshipped an angel in his stead. But the orthodox doctors of the church have truly and wisely understood and taught that the same chief angel was the word of God, who even then began to perform some services introductory to his execution of the office of mediator. For though he was not yet incarnate, he descended, as it were, in a mediatorial capacity, that he might approach the faithful with greater familiarity. His familiar intercourse with men gave him the name of an angel, yet he still retained what properly belonged to him, and continued the ineffably glorious God. The same truth is attested by Hosea, 
who, after relating the wrestling of Jacob with an angel, says, The Lord Jehovah, God so of few hosts, sponges, Jehovah is, is his memorial. Servetus again cavils that God employed the person of an angel as though the prophet did not confirm what had been delivered by Moses. Ah, uh, no, he's arguing Wherefore against Servetus. Wherefore thou dost ask after my name? And the confession of the holy patriarch when he declares, I have seen God face to face, sufficiently declares that he was not a created angel, but one in whom resided the fullness of deity. Hence also the representation of Paul that Christ was the conductor of the people in the wilderness because though the time of his humiliation was not yet arrived, the eternal word then exhibited a type of the office to which he was appointed. Hmm. Now if the second chapter of Zechariah be strictly and coolly examined, the angel who sends another angel is immediately pronounced here. the God of hosts, and supreme power is ascribed to him. I omit testimonies innumerable on which our faith safely rests, although they have little influence on the Jews. For when it is said in Isaiah, Lo, this is our God, we have waited for him, and he will save us, this is Jehovah. All who have eyes may perceive that this is God, who arises for the salvation of his people. And the emphatical repetition of these pointed expressions forbids an application of this passage to any other repetition. than to Christ. But still more plain and decisive is the passage of Malachi, where he prophesies that the Lord, the word of who an angel is sought, word of... should come into his temple. So that's an interesting question, Peter. I mean, if, as long as he's a faithful messenger giving a message, I mean, the word angel uh, is a translation of the same word that means um, messenger. So if an angel is bringing a word from the Lord, then you would say it's the word of the Lord. But a, an argument he's making is these appearances of the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, which he believed, and a lot of Christians, there's a lot of good reason to believe so, that there's the, the appearances of the angel of the Lord in a lot of contexts may have been an incarnation of Christ um, before he had a physical body. And so it, it actually was God in certain as, in certain instances. Um, that's a slightly separate topic, but yes to your question, I think, in general. The temple was exclusively consecrated to the one most high God, yet the prophet claims it as belonging to Christ. Whence it follows that he is the same God that was always worshipped among the Jews. The New Testament abounds with innumerable testimonies. We must therefore endeavour briefly to select a few rather than to collect them all. Though the apostles spake of him after he had appeared in flesh as the mediator, yet all that I shall adduce will be adapted to prove his eternal deity. In the first place, it is worthy of particular observation that the Apostle represents those things which were predicted concerning the eternal God as either already exhibited in Christ or to be accomplished in him at some future period. The prediction of Isaiah that the Lord of hosts would be for a stone of stumbling and for a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel, Paul asserts to have been fulfilled in Christ. Therefore he declares that Christ is the Lord of hosts. There is a similar instance in another place. We shall all stand, says he, before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. Since God in Isaiah declares this concerning himself, and Christ actually exhibits it in his own person, it follows that he is the very God whose glory cannot be transferred to another. The Apostle's quotation from the Psalms also, in his epistle to the Ephesians, is evidently applicable to none but God. When he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive. Understanding that ascension to have been prefigured by the exertions of the divine power in the signal victories of David over the heathen nations, he signifies that the text was more fully accomplished in Christ. Thus John attests that it was the glory of the Son which was revealed in a vision to Isaiah, whereas the prophet himself records that he saw the majesty of God. That's right. And those so, praises this is actually a really in... interesting point he's making. Uh, I don't know if you, any of you have ever heard of James White's ministry. Uh, he's a Reformed Baptist out in Phoenix. But he's used this argument. It's really interesting um, in terms of defending the, the deity of Christ. Um, it, if you look at Isaiah chapter 6, it says that Isaiah saw the Lord uh, and saw his glory. If you look at John chapter 12, John quotes that passage in... Uh, Isaiah 6, and it talks about um, 
it talks about him seeing the glory of the Lord. But in context, when he talks about when it talks about Isaiah seeing his glory, when he's talking in John six, the his is Jesus, his glory. And so, I, so John's basically saying the glory that Isaiah saw in Isaiah six was the glory of Christ. And therefore Christ is the God being spoken of, uh, in Isaiah six. So it's really interesting. So that, you know, Calvin saw it and apologists today see it. It's pretty cool. Epistle to the Hebrews ascribes to the son beyond all doubt, most evidently belong to God. Thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth. Some and the slight ambiguity. The of thine hands, etc. Again, Interesting. let all the angels of God worship him. Nor is it any misapplication of them when he refers them to Christ, since all that is predicted in those psalms has been accomplished only by him. For him. it was he who arose and had mercy upon Zion. It was he yeah, who I mean, claimed like as his own the immediate the grammar, there might be something debatable, but if I remember, that's sort of the, and why the should flow John, of thought itself seems to point to that. The commencement of his gospel, that the word was always God, have hesitated to attribute to Christ the majesty of God. And why should Paul have been afraid to place Christ on the tribunal of God, after having so publicly preached his divinity when he called him God blessed forever? And to show how consistent he is with himself on this subject, he says also that God was manifest in the flesh. If he is God right, so blessed forever, about... he is the same to whom this apostle in another place affirms all glory and honor to be what due. What passage is he talking about he conceals about not, but openly proclaims that being in the form of God, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. And lest the impious might object that he is a sort of artificial God, John goes further and affirms that this is the true God and eternal life, although we ought to be fully satisfied by his being called God, especially by... Why does it matter? ...expressly avers that there are no more gods Why does than which one. thing matter? I mean, Paul who says, though there be that are called gods, well, it's whether in terms in heaven of or in earth, the point mean squared error is making, God, if there's ambiguity in the Greek, things. Um, when we hear from might, the same it mouth could that, mean that God that's was manifested in the flesh, not a, God uh, has purchased the church with his own blood, you shouldn't only Why base your whole argument for God, the deity of Christ no on that one passage. And there is no doubt it seems pretty decisive to me, but of the same opinion. I'd have to hear Thomas about the uh, responses publicly from confessing him to be better his experts Lord and in God Greek. declares him to be the same true God whom he had always worshipped. If we judge of his divinity from the works which the scriptures attribute to him, it will thence appear with increasing evidence. For when he said that he had from the beginning continually cooperated with the Father, the Jews, stupid as oh, they were right. about his other declarations, yeah. yet perceived Jehovah's that Witnesses he had try to tear apart the Greek. divine power. Right. And therefore, as yeah, John informs true. us, they sought but the Lord to kill him. I kind of wonder, though, how ambiguous it actually is, because there's a lot of Jehovah's Witness propaganda that will say that it's ambiguous, but they kind of are inserting the ambiguity, and there's really not much question about it. Um... They, they do that in a few areas. You can see how you can see it when they retranslate things for their uh, for their translation. Some of it's very willful. Um, but again, I'd want to hear, I'd want to hear, uh, like a James White is a really good. Uh, he's really actually very good with Greek, and uh, has debated Jehovah's Witnesses. He's never spoken of um, John twelve as being particularly ambiguous. Do I explain the truth of what we are listening? I do my best when I feel like there's a good place to pause where I have something to add, but we shall see how much of that there will be. They even have their own Bible, right? The New World Translation, yeah. Let's see here. Verse in John, the JWs actually didn't mistranslate. I think that one, um, they did not. I think, but I don't think they changed much either. Because he not or did, only or did they? You have to tell me. But said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. How great then must be our stupidity if we perceive not this passage to be a plain assertion of his deity, to preside over the world by his almighty providence and to govern all things by the rod of his own power, which the mm -hmm. apostle attributes to him, belongs exclusively to the Creator. I'm trying to and think he of how I with the Father, not only in the government. There's another passage. Uh, yeah, okay. So maybe maybe they did change that one. There's one they didn't change too much though. Although I did look at it and sort of in the whole flow of thought, they've created some ambiguity. But 
some of the wording is basically the same. If you look at Hebrews chapter one, you see a big description of Christ, but it's a, but it's actually a quote from Psalm 102. And, uh, in the Psalm, it's referring to who they would say is Jehovah, but in Hebrews one, it's referring to Christ. So it's a similar thing where you see old Testament language applied to the son. Um, I think, and actually not only that, but they have the same cross references. Burr, 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 burr. Not to start an argument. Seeing the evidence. No, yeah, I don't think mean squared error is saying that they didn't mistranslate it. He's just saying that in the one passage we're talking about in John 12 in the Greek, they may have done it right. I don't know. I'd have to, I'd have to see arguments about that written out. Um, from a Christian perspective, it doesn't matter in the sense that we do believe both of them are members of the Trinity, that they're both God. But there is a distinction between the two in that Christ is the Son and the Father is the Father. They're distinct in their personhood, but they're one in their being. And it is important to distinguish them because they communicate, you know, like with each other in Scripture. And so they're distinct, but they're united. And so the distinction is important, but the union is also important. And so both are true. <clears throat> Let's see here. My play button doesn't always work. The world, but also in all other offices which cannot be communicated to creatures. The Lord proclaims by the prophet, I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for yeah, mine own sake. To mistranslate it. According to this declaration, well, when the Jews thought that Christ committed an injury against God by undertaking to forgive sins, he not only asserted in express terms that this power belonged to him, but proved it by a miracle. We see, therefore, that he hath not the ministry, but the power of remission of sins, which the Lord declares shall never be transferred from himself to another. Is it not the prerogative of God alone to examine and penetrate the secret thoughts of the heart? Yet Christ possessed that power, which is a proof of his divinity. Yeah, I'm personally still wondering whether it is ambiguous but or whether ambiguity was inserted. But in his miracles, I don't know how much they deal with John 12 in general. And apostles performed miracles similar. A lot of arguments they're not even aware of. They're so dependent there on their own literature. In this respect, that they, in their ministry, dispensed the favors of God, whereas his miracles were performed by his exertions of his own power. He sometimes, indeed, used prayer that he might glorify the Father. So but we're in doing a little too much from the we perceive here. the manifest displays of his own power. And how should not he be the true author of miracles, who by his own authority committed the dispensation of them to others? For the evangelists relate that he gave his apostles power to raise the dead, to heal the leprous, to cast out devils, etc. And they performed that ministry in such a manner as plainly to discover that the power proceeded solely from Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ, says Peter, arise and walk. It is no wonder, therefore, that Christ should bring forward his miracles to convince the incredulity of the Jews, since, being performed by his own power, they afforded most ample evidence of his divinity. Besides, if out of God there be no salvation, no righteousness, no life, but Christ contains all these things in himself, it certainly demonstrates him to be God. Let it not be objected that life and salvation are infused into him by God, for he is not said to have received salvation, but to be <laughs> himself salvation. And if no one be good but God alone, how can he be a mere man who is, I will not say good and righteous, but goodness and righteousness itself? Even from the beginning of the creation, according to the testimony of an evangelist, in him was life, and the life then existed as the light of men." Supported by such proofs, therefore, we venture to repose our faith and hope on him, whereas we know that it is impious and sacrilegious for any man to place his confidence in creatures. He says, ye believe here. in God, believe also in me. And in this sense Paul interprets two passages of Isaiah, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Again, there shall be a root of Jesse we need to start that shall rise this to out reign over the above, Gentiles, so we fall down in into him it. shall the Gentiles trust. And why should we search for more testimonies from Scripture when this declaration occurs so frequently? He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. The invocation arising from faith is also directed to him, which nevertheless 
peculiarly belongs, if anything peculiarly belongs, to the divine majesty. For a prophet says, Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord, Jehovah, shall be delivered. And Solomon, the name of the Lord is a strong tower, the righteous runneth into it and is safe. But the name of Christ is invoked for salvation. It follows, therefore, that he is Jehovah. Moreover, we have an example of such invocation in Stephen when he says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And afterwards in the whole church, as Ananias testifies in the same book, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he has done to thy saints that call on thy name. And to make it more clearly understood that all the fullness of the Godhead dwelleth bodily in Christ, the apostle confesses that he had introduced among the Corinthians no other doctrine than the knowledge of him, and that this had been the only subject of his preaching. What a remarkable and important consideration is it that the name of the Son only is preached to us, whereas God commands us to glory in the knowledge of himself alone. Who can dare to assert that he is a mere creature, the knowledge of whom is our only glory? It must also be remarked that the salutations prefixed to the epistles of Paul implores the same blessings from the Son as from the Father, whence we learn not only that those things which our Heavenly Father bestows are obtained for us by his intercession, but that the Son, by a communion of power, is himself the author of them. This practical knowledge is unquestionably more certain and solid second, than folks. any idle speculation. For then the pious mind has the nearest view of the divine presence, and almost touches it when it experiences itself to be quickened, illuminated, saved, justified, and sanctified. End of section 3、Oop, did I hit the pause button? Or did it finish the file? We might have finished the file. Oh, we did. Okay. So let's see here. All right. Baby's finally asleep. Goodness. All right. So we got to go to、uh, the website where I got this. How's everybody doing? <laughs> Interest relatively peaked here. Whoops. No, we don't want that. We want to type in,、uh, let's see. Um, box. What was the? Where's my history? Because I've got to get.、Uh, oh, we've still got that open. I don't want that or that. There we go. All right. Because I want to download the next file here. So give me just a moment. Whoop. Okay. Just a moment. Um, let's see. I have to hit my history. LibreVox, that's what it's called. All right. I just got to get to the right website and get the file downloaded. Okay. So we did、uh, chapter 11 through 13, 13. So it's going to be. Oh, it's book one. That's why it's. Not right there. Okay, here it is. So let's click on this. Section four of. All right, I'm going to download it. Download, please. 66 megabytes. So I'd rather have it in、uh, Windows Media Player. But it should go right into the next section. I didn't think we'd actually finish all that. Where are we at? We're at an hour and 13 minutes. We've covered a lot of ground. <laughs> am I recording? I think I am. Okay. All right, we're halfway there. Show all, please. 30 seconds left. So I can exit out of this and it'll just open up the next one. All right. So、it's going to take a second. Boy, there's a lot left to mine out here, but we、uh, managed to get all the water, I think, which is nice. Here we go. Boing. Nope. 
need a little light over here. All right. So we got the full staircase. That's probably the only part that I won't uh, mine out because I always want to get back to there. Okay. Good for now. But let's get up as high as we can. All right. File's probably done. Yep. Here we go. Section four hey. of Institutes of the Christian Religion. Yeah, I'm thinking I'll make a nice base John in Calvin, here at some point. Translated by John Allen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book one, chapter 13, section 14, to book one, chapter 14, section eight. Here we go. Wherefore, the proof of the deity of the Spirit must be derived principally oh, so from, from the same Christ sources. Christ to the Spirit. There is no obscurity in the testimony of Moses in the history of the creation that the Spirit of God was expanded on the abyss or chaos, for it signifies not only that the beautiful state of the world which we now behold owes its preservation to the power of the Spirit, but that previous to its being thus adorned, the Spirit was engaged in brooding over the confused mass. The declaration of Isaiah bids defiance to all cavils, Whoa. and now the Lord God and his Spirit hath sent me. For the Holy Spirit is united in the exercise of supreme power in the mission of prophets, which is a proof of his divine majesty. But the best confirmation, as I have remarked, we shall derive from familiar experience. For what the scriptures ascribe to him, and what we ourselves learn by the certain experience of piety, is not at all applicable to any creature. For it is he who, being universally diffused, sustains and animates all things in heaven and in earth. And this very thing excludes him from the number of creatures, that he is circumscribed by no limits, but transfuses through all his own vigorous influence to inspire them with being, life, and motion. Hey, this Father. is clearly a work of deity. Again, if regeneration to an incorruptible life be more important and excellent than any present life, what must we think of him from whose power it proceeds? But the scripture teaches in various places that he is the author of regeneration by a power not derived but properly his own, and not of regeneration only but likewise of the future immortality. Finally, to him as well as to the Son are applied all those offices so yes, which are Dad, this is Calvin deity, arguing for the deity for of the Spirit. searcheth even the deep things of God, who admits no creature to a share in Oops. his counsels. He bestows wisdom and the faculty of speech, whereas the Lord declares to Moses that this can only be done by Whoops. himself. So through that. him we attain to a participation of God, to feel his vivifying energy upon us. Our justification is his work. From him proceed power, sanctification, truth, grace, and every other blessing we can conceive, since oh, there is boy. but one spirit from whom every kind of gifts descends. For this for passage of Paul is worthy of particular attention. There are diversities of gifts, and there are differences of administrations, but the same spirit, because it represents him not only as the principal and source of them, but also as the author, which is yet more clearly expressed a little after in these words. All these worketh that only and the selfsame spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. For if he were not a subsistence in the deity, judgment and voluntary determination would never be ascribed to him. Paul therefore very clearly attributes right, so he's to the saying... spirit divine... So he's saying that the spirit, like often, like we talked about Jehovah's Witnesses before, they tend to talk about the spirit as like an energy. He's saying one of the broad arguments for the deity of the spirit is how much the spirit is talked about as having personality and the ability to choose things. Whoops. Okay, now we're stuck here. <laughs> we got to do uh, this, and then we got to do like this. Let me up. There we go. Okay. Power, and thereby demonstrates him to be an How long is the auto audio file? In God. Oh, it's probably about an hour, hour and Nor a half. Nor does the scripture, when it speaks of him, refrain from giving him the appellation of God. For Paul concludes how long that we the are the last one was God that we got through. because his spirit dwelleth in us. This must not be passed over without particular notice, for the frequent promises of God that he will choose us for a temple for himself receive no other accomplishment than by the inhabitants of his spirit in us. Certainly, as Augustine excellently observes, if we were commanded to erect to the Spirit a temple of wood and stone, forasmuch as God is the sole object of worship, it would be a clear proof of his divinity. How much clearer, then, is the proof, now that we are commanded not to erect one, but to be ourselves his temples. 
<laughs> and the apostle calls us sometimes. He always brings the up arguments I wouldn't have thought of. Sometimes the temple of the Holy Spirit, both in the same signification. Peter, reprehending Ananias for having lied to the Holy Ghost, told him that he had not lied unto men but unto God. And where Isaiah introduces the Lord of hosts as the speaker, Paul informs us that it is the Holy Spirit who speaks. Indeed, while the prophets invariably declare that the words which they utter are those of the Lord of hosts, Christ and the apostles refer them to the Holy Spirit. Whence it follows that he is the true Jehovah, who is the primary author of the prophecies. Again, God complains that his anger was provoked by the perverseness of the people. Isaiah, in reference to the same conduct, says that, they vexed his Holy Spirit. Lastly, if blasphemy against you the Spirit out, be not forgiven, either in this world or in that which is to come, <laughs> whilst a man may obtain pardon, who has been guilty of blasphemy against the Son, this is an open declaration of his divine majesty, to defame or degrade which is an inexpiable crime. I intentionally pass over many testimonies which were used by the fathers. To them there appeared much plausibility in citing this passage from David, by the word of the Lord the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth, to prove that the creation of the world was the work Aren't of the it? Holy Spirit, as well as of the Son. But since a repetition of the same thing twice is common in the Psalms, and in Isaiah the spirit of his mouth means the same as his word, this is but a weak argument. Therefore I have determined to... That's interesting. He doesn't, he doesn't uh, go for every argument just because it's an argument. He says, this is a weak one, so I'm not going to use it. I'd say that's something. That's a that's a, an area where he's more convincing to me in a lot of areas than Luther. Luther throws like everything against the wall, like when he's defending like total depravity in the bondage of the will. He throws everything against the wall, and some of them I'm like, that's a good one. That one's kind of like you're stretching it, dude. <laughs> oh, you want to listen some more? Yeah. I can get it working. And find myself to a sober statement <laughs> of go. those evidences on which pious minds may satisfactorily rest. As God afforded a clearer manifestation of himself at the advent of Christ, the three persons also then became better known. Among many testimonies, let us be satisfied with this one. Paul connects together these three, Lord, Faith, and Baptism, in such a manner as to reason from one to another. Since there is but one faith, hence he proves that there is but one Lord. Since there is but one baptism, he shows that there is Shoot. also but one faith. Okay, get out of here. Therefore, if we are initiated by baptism into the faith and religion of one God, we must necessarily suppose him to be the true God into whose name we are baptized. Nor can it be doubted but that in this solemn commission, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, Christ intended to testify that the perfect light of faith was now exhibited. For this is equivalent to being baptized into the name of the one God, who hath clearly manifested himself in the Father, Son, and Spirit, whence it evidently appears that in the divine essence there exist three persons, in whom is known the one God. And truly, since faith ought not to be looking about hither and thither, or to be wandering through the varieties of inconstancy, but to direct its views towards the one God, to be fixed on him and to adhere to him, it may easily be proved from these premises that, if there be various kinds of faith, there must also be a plurality of gods. Baptism, being a sacrament of faith, confirms to us the unity of God, because it is but one. Hence also we conclude that it is not lawful to be baptized except into the name of the one God, because we embrace the faith of him into whose name we are baptized. Here we go. What then was intended by Christ when he commanded baptism to be administered in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, but that one faith ought to be exercised in the Father, Son, and Spirit? And what is that but a clear testimony that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are the one God? Therefore, since it is an undeniable truth that there is one God and only one, we conclude the Word and Spirit to be no other than the very essence of the Deity. The greatest degree of folly was betrayed by the Arians who confessed the divinity of the Son, but denied him to possess the substance of God. Nor were the Macedonians free from a similar delusion who would explain the term spirit the to mean only the gifts of grace conferred upon man. For as wisdom, understanding, prudence, fortitude, and the That's fear of the Lord proceed from him, so itself. he alone is the spirit of wisdom, prudence, fortitude, and piety. Nor is he himself divided according to the distribution of his graces, but, as the Apostle declares, how variously soever they are divided, he always remains one and the same. 
Got more over here. On the other right? hand, also we find in the scriptures a distinction between the Father and the Word. This one you think you're almost done. There's a whole other area. Between the Word and the Spirit, in the discussion of which the magnitude of the mystery reminds us that we ought to proceed with the utmost reverence and sobriety. I am exceedingly pleased with this observation of Gregory Nazianzen. I cannot think of the one, but I am immediately surrounded with the splendor of the three. Nor can I clearly discover the three, but I am suddenly carried back to the one. Wherefore, let us not imagine such a trinity of persons as includes an idea of separation, or does not immediately recall us to the unity. The names of Father, Son, and Spirit certainly imply a real distinction, let no one suppose them to be mere epithets by which God is variously designated from his works. Right. But it is a distinction, not a division. The passages already cited show that the That's Son what I was saying before, a distinction without a division. The Father, because the Word had not been with God, or had his glory with the Father, unless he had been distinct from him. He likewise distinguishes the Father from himself when he says that there is another that beareth witness of him. And to the same effect is what is declared in another place, that the Father created all things by the Word, which he could not have done unless he had been in some sense distinct from him. Besides, the Father descended not to the earth, but he who came forth from the Father. The Father neither died nor rose again, but he who was sent by the Father. Nor did this distinction commence at the Incarnation, but it is evident that before that period he was the only begotten in the bosom of the Father. For who can undertake to assert that the Son first entered into the bosom of the Father when he descended from heaven to assume a human nature? He, therefore, was in the bosom of the Father before, and possessed his glory with the Father. The distinction between the Holy Spirit and the Father is announced by Christ when he says that he proceedeth from the Father. But how often does he represent him as another, distinct from himself, as when he promises that another comforter should be sent, and in many other places... I doubt the propriety of borrowing similitudes from human things to express the force of this distinction. The fathers sometimes practice this method, but they otherwise confess the great disproportion of all the similitudes which they introduce. Wherefore, I greatly dread in this instance every degree of presumption, lest the introduction of anything unseasonable should afford an occasion of calumny to the malicious, or of error to the ignorant. Yet it is not right to be silent on the distinction which we find expressed in the scriptures, which is this, that to the Father is attributed the principle of action, the fountain and source of all things, to the Son, wisdom, counsel, and the arrangement of all operations, and the power and efficacy of the action is assigned to the Spirit. Huh. Moreover, though eternity belongs to the Father, and to the Son and Spirit, I have also, seen Book of Eli. since God can I never like that have movie. been destitute of his wisdom or power, and in eternity we must not inquire after anything prior or posterior, Yet the observation of order is not vain or superfluous, while the Father... Oh, so he's making another distinction here that I often use. I probably learned it from... I probably learned it from someone who learned it from him, but, like, he's making a differentiation between the logical order of things and the chronological order of things. So he's saying, like, certain thing, there's certain things members of the Trinity did in eternity, and because they happened in eternity... Um, they're outside of time, which means there is no chronological order in which they acted. Um, it's all one, but there is a logical order to them. In other words, like this, for instance, the spirit proceeds from the father. Uh, uh, but that doesn't mean that the spirit came after the father chronologically. Like there was a time when the spirit wasn't. Um, but, logically the spirit flows from the father um that's their logical connection but they're both eternal um same with like the, the father begets the son um christ is eternal but he's eternally begotten and that's their logical order the father does not proceed from the son they're distinct and that's their order but not chronologically logically they do so he's sort of but not right now he's talking about the way that, that their actions in creation, I think. But uh, he's starting to explain that. It is mentioned as first, in the next place the Son as from him, and then the Spirit as from both. For the mm -hmm. mind of every man naturally inclines to the Agreed, consideration, Peter C. first of God, secondly of the wisdom emanating from him, and lastly to the power by which he executes the decrees of his wisdom. 
For this reason the Son is said to be from the Father, and the Spirit from both the Father and the Son, and that in various places, but nowhere more clearly than in the eighth chapter of the Epistle to the Romans, where the same Spirit is indifferently denominated the Spirit of Christ and the Spirit of Him that raised up Christ from the dead, and that without any impropriety. For Peter also testifies that it was the Spirit of Christ by whom the prophets prophesied, whereas the Scripture so frequently declares that it was the Spirit of God the Father. Hmm. This distinction is so far from opposing the most absolute simplicity and unity of the divine being, that it affords a proof that the Son is one God with the Father, because he has the same Spirit with him, and that the Spirit is not a different substance from the Father and the Son, because he is the Spirit of the Father and of the Son. For the whole nature is in each hypostasis, and each has something peculiar to himself. The Father is entirely in the Son, and the Son entirely in the Father, according to his own declaration, I am in the Father, and the Father in me. Nor do ecclesiastical writers allow that one is divided from the other by any difference of essence. These distinctive appellations, says Augustine, denote their reciprocal relations to each other, and not the substance itself, which is but one. This explanation may serve to reconcile the opinions of the fathers, which would otherwise appear totally repugnant to each other. For sometimes they state that the Son originates from the Father, and at other times assert that he has essential divinity from himself, and so is, together with the Father, the one first cause of all. Augustine, in another place, admirably and perspicuously, explains the cause of this diversity in the following manner. Christ. It's so funny, he quotes Augustine a lot. Um... This is sort of something you'll notice as you read the reformers when it comes to like theology like this or theology like um, justification or um, like uh, grace through faith and things like that. They love to quote Augustine, um, uh, but he was a reformer. So there was a lot of argument against the Roman Catholics and uh, the Roman Catholics love to quote Augustine, too. But they'll quote Augustine when it comes to the structure of the church and how that should go. Um, and they're both quoting Augustine properly because those that really was, you know, Augustine really did lay the groundwork for the way the Roman Catholic Church functions. But he also has a lot of theology the Reformers used to break away from the Catholic Church because the Catholics will not quote Augustine when it comes to justification and things like that as much. Um and uh, and so people have said like the Reformation was basically Augustine's theology on justification or his theology of salvation confronting his theology of the church. Um, and so yeah, you got a lot of you got a lot of Augustine in sections like this. And Augustine's great on those topics, but you know he definitely did a lot of good things, but also set up some problematic things for later on in church history. Considered in himself is called God but with relation to the Father he is called the Son. Again, the Father considered in himself is called God, but with relation to the Son he is called the Father. He who with relation to the Son is called the Father is not the Son. He who with relation to the Father is called the Son is not the Father. They who are severally called the Father and the Son are the same God. Therefore, when we speak simply of the Son without reference to the Father, we truly and properly assert him to be self-existent, and therefore call him the sole first cause, but when we distinctly treat of the relation between him and the Father, we justly represent him as originating from the Father. The first book of Augustine on the Trinity is entirely occupied with the explication of this subject, and it is far more safe to rest satisfied with that relation which he states than by curiously penetrating into the sublime mystery to wander through a multitude of vain speculations. <laughs> Therefore, let such as love sobriety, and will be contented with the measure of faith, briefly attend to what is useful to be known, which is, that when we profess to believe in one God, the word God denotes a single and simple essence in which we comprehend three persons, or hypostases, and that therefore, whenever the word God is used indefinitely, the Son and Spirit are intended as much as the Father, but when the Son is associated with the Father, that introduces the reciprocal relation of one to the other, and thus we distinguish between the persons. But since the peculiar properties of the persons produce a certain order, so that the original cause is in the Father, whenever the Father and the Son or Spirit are mentioned together, the name of God is peculiarly ascribed to the Father. By this method the unity of the essence is preserved, and the order go. is retained. 
which, however, derogates nothing from the deity of the Son and the Spirit. And indeed, as we have already seen, that the apostles assert him to be the Son of God, whom Moses and the prophets have represented as Jehovah, it is always necessary to recur to the unity of the essence. Wherefore, it would be a detestable sacrilege for us to call the Son another God, different from the Father, because the simple name of God admits of no relation. Nor can God, with respect to himself, be denominated either the one or the other. Hmm. Now, that the name Jehovah, in an indefinite sense, is applicable to Christ, appears even from the words of Paul. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, because, after relating the answer of Christ, my grace is sufficient for thee, he immediately subjoins, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For it is certain that the word Lord is there used for Jehovah, and to restrict it to the person of the mediator would be frivolous nice. and puerile, that since worked. it is an absolute declaration containing no comparison nice, nice, between nice. the Son and the Father. Got these guys hanging around. And we know that the apostles, following the custom of the Greek translators, invariably use the word kurios, Lord, instead of Jehovah. And not to seek far for an example of this, Paul prayed to the Lord in no other sense than is intended in a passage of Joel, cited by Peter, Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But for the peculiar ascription of this name to the Son, another reason will be given in its proper place. Suffice it at present to observe that when Paul had prayed to God absolutely, he immediately subjoins the name of Christ. Thus also the whole deity is by Christ himself denominated a spirit, for nothing opposes the spirituality of the whole divine essence, in which are comprehended the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, which is plain from the Scripture. Oh, for as we there find God denominated a spirit, so we find also the Holy Spirit, for as much as he is an hypostasis of the whole essence, represented both as the Spirit of God and as proceeding from God. But since Satan, out? in order to subvert the very foundations this of our faith, so has always been exciting great contentions concerning the divine essence of the Son and Spirit, and the distinction of the persons, and in almost all ages has instigated impious spirits to vex the orthodox teachers on this account, and is also endeavouring in the present day, with the old embers, to kindle a new flame, it becomes necessary here to refute the perverse and fanciful notions which some persons what have imbibed. What does embarked. the word Lord... Hitherto it has been... What does the word Lord describe? That's actually a good question because um, if you look uh, at the Old Testament, you'll notice a lot of the time the word Lord is uh, all capital letters. I'm trying to remember what that's called. I think it's called the Tetragrammaton. But basically, there, be, there arose a uh, tradition um, where the the Jews felt it was too... Um, it, if it, it was risky to use the Lord's name, Yahweh, because it forced them to risk use, taking the Lord's name in vain, and so they would not write out the word, the Y-H-W-H, the name of the Lord, and so they would replace that with um, L-O-R-D. Well, that was, I'm trying to think, I'm trying to think of how that works in the, because uh, that's like how it shows up in English, but I'm trying to remember how that works in their original languages. But, um, uh, but generally, when you see the word Lord in the Old Testament, it means that the word Yahweh was originally originally there. Um, and so, yeah, Lord generally, I mean, there's multiple uses of it. Um, there's other meanings like, uh, say like, yes, my Lord, that could be like a, a captain in an army or something. But in relationship to God, yeah, it's, it's a reference to Yahweh. Um <clears throat> Victor plays. It's a holy title. Yeah, we're uh, listening to Calvin to while we the play. Docile, and not to combat the obstinate and contentious. But now, having calmly explained and proved the truth, we must vindicate it from all, all the cavils of the oh, wicked. Sponges go. Although I shall make it my principal em. study that those who readily and implicitly attend to the divine word may have stable ground on which they may confidently rest. On this... Indeed, oh, if here. on any of the secret mysteries of the scripture we ought to philosophize with great sobriety and moderation, and also with extreme caution, lest either our ideas or our language should proceed beyond the limits of the divine word. For how can the infinite essence of God be defined by the narrow capacity of the human mind, which could never yet certainly determine the nature of the body of the sun, though the object of our daily contemplation? How can the human mind, by its own efforts, penetrate into an examination of the essence of God, when it is totally ignorant of its own? 
Wherefore, let us freely leave to God the knowledge of himself. For he alone, as Hilary says, is a competent witness for himself, being only known by himself. And we shall certainly leave it to him if our conceptions of him correspond to the manifestations which he has given us of himself, and our inquiries concerning him are confined to his word. There are extant, on this argument, five homilies of Chrysostom against the Anomui, which, however, were not sufficient to restrain the presumptuous garrulity of those sophists, for they discovered this no greater volunteer in reader this instance is like, than in every other. Not sure the very about unhappy this consequences vocabulary of this Calvin. temerity <laughs> should warn us to study this question with more docility than subtlety, and not allow ourselves to investigate God anywhere but in his sacred word, or to form any idea of him but such as are agreeable to his word, or to speak anything concerning him but what is derived from the same word, but if the distinction of Father, Son, and Spirit in the one deity, as it is not easy to be comprehended, occasions some understandings more labour and trouble than is desirable, let them remember that the mind of man, when it indulges its curiosity, enters into a labyrinth, and let them submit to be guided by the heavenly oracles, however they may not comprehend the height of this mystery. To compose a catalogue of the errors by which the purity of the faith has been attacked on this point of doctrine would be too prolix and tedious, without being <laughs> profitable, and most of the heretics so strenuously exerted themselves to effect the total extinction of the divine glory by their gross reveries that they thought it sufficient to unsettle I love the way he goes after heretics. His vocabulary gets awesome. From a few men there soon arose <laughs> numerous sects of whom some would divide the divine essence and others would confound the distinction which subsists but Right, so going back to the beginning, he's saying that there's those, who's, those who divide the essence, like the subordinationists, like uh, the Arians, and those who confound them, like the Sibelians. Um, basically saying that there's not three persons, but one person and one being are those who say that the separate persons are separate gods in some sense, one subordinate to the other usually. Yeah. Between the persons. But if we maintain what has already been sufficiently demonstrated from the scripture, that the essence of the one God which pertains to the Father, to the Son, and to the Spirit is simple and undivided, and on the other hand that the Father is by some property distinguished from the Son, and likewise the Son from the Spirit, the gate will be shut, not only against Arius and Sibelius, but also against all the other ancient heresiarchs. But since our own times have witnessed some madmen, as Servetus and his followers, who have involved everything in new subtleties, a brief exposure of their fallacies will not be unuseful. The word Trinity was so odious and even detestable to Servetus that he asserted all Trinitarians, as he called them, to be atheists. <laughs> I omit his impertinent and scurrilous language, but this was the substance of his speculations, that it is representing God as consisting of three parts, when three persons are said to subsist in his essence, and that this triad forget what is the error of, some, of uh, being repugnant to the divine was. unity. At the same time, he maintained the persons to be certain external ideas, which have no real subsistence in the divine essence, but give us a figurative representation of God, under this or the other form and that in the beginning there was no distinction in God, because the Word was once Already dragon same fist. as the Spirit. Sounds good. But that after Christ appeared God of God, there emanated from him another God, even the Spirit. Though he sometimes glosses over his impertinencies with allegories, as when he says that the eternal Word of God was the Spirit of Christ with God, and the reflection of his image, and that the Spirit was a shadow of the Deity, Yet he afterwards destroys the deity of both, asserting that, according to the mode of dispensation, there is a part of God in both the Son and the Spirit, just as the same Spirit, substantially diffused in us, and even in wood and stones, is a portion of the deity. Whoops. What he broached concerning the person of the Mediator, we shall examine in the proper place. But this monstrous fiction that a divine person is nothing but a visible appearance of the glory of God will not need a prolix refutation. For when John pronounces that the word, Logos, was God before Logos. the creation of the world, he sufficiently discriminates him from an ideal form. But if then also, and from the remotest eternity, that word, Logos, who was God, was with the Father, and possessed his own glory with the Father, he certainly could not be an external or figurative splendor, 
but it necessarily follows that he was a real hypostasis subsisting in God himself. But although no mention is made of the spirit, but in the history of the creation of the world, yet he is there introduced, not as a shadow, but as the essential power of God, stuff. since Moses relates that the chaotic mass was supported by him. It then appeared, therefore, that the eternal spirit had always existed in the deity, since he cherished and sustained the confused matter of the heaven and earth till it attained Actually. a state of beauty and order. He could not then be an image or representation of God according to the dreams of Servetus. But in other places he is constrained to make a fuller disclosure of his impiety, saying that God, in his eternal reason, decreeing for himself a visible sun, has visibly exhibited himself in this manner. For if this be true, there is no other divinity left to Christ than as he has been appointed a son by an eternal decree of God. Besides, he so transforms those phantasms which he substitutes instead of the hypostases, that he hesitates not to imagine new accidents or properties in God. But the most execrable blasphemy of all is his promiscuous confusion of the Son of God and the Spirit with all the creatures. For he asserts that in the divine essence there are parts and divisions, every portion of which is God, and especially that the souls of the faithful are co-eternal and consubstantial with God, oh. though in another place he assigns substantial deity not only to the human soul, but to all created things. From the Sir same Vetus corrupt source has that? proceeded another heresy, equally monstrous. For some worthless men, to escape the odium and disgrace which attended the impious tenants of Servetus, have confessed, indeed, that there are three persons, but with this explanation, that the Father, who alone is truly and properly God, hath uh, created the Son the and Spirit, and transfused his deity into them. Nor do they refrain from this dreadful manner of expressing themselves, that the Father is distinguished from the Son and Spirit as being the sole possessor of the divine essence. Their first plea in support of Why this notion is, this so is that Christ is commonly called the Son of God. Whence they conclude that no other is properly God but the Father. But they observe not that although the name of God is common also to the Son, yet that it is sometimes ascribed to the Father, kat exochen, by way of eminence, because he is the fountain and original of the deity, and this in order to denote the simple unity of the essence. They object that if he is truly the Son of God, it is absurd Keep to account him the Son of a person. I reply that both are true, that he is the Son of God because he is the Word begotten of the Father, before time began, for we are not yet speaking of the person of the Mediator. And to be explicit, we must notice the person, that the name of God may not be understood absolutely, but for the Father. For if we acknowledge no other to be God than the Father, it will be a manifest Ceiling degradation first. of the yeah. dignity of the Son. Whenever mention is made of the deity, therefore, <laughs> there must be no crazy. opposition be admitted between the Father and the Son, as though the name of the XP true God the belonged nice. exclusively to the Father. For surely the God who appeared to Isaiah was the only true God, whom nevertheless John affirms to have been Christ. He likewise, who by the mouth of Isaiah declared that he was to be a rock of offence to the Jews, was the only true God, whom Paul pronounces to have been Christ. He who proclaims by Isaiah, as I live, every knee shall bow to me, is the only true God. Start to lower at least. the same to Christ. To the same purpose are the testimonies recited by the Apostle. Thou, Lord, hast laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens, and let all the angels of God worship him. These ascriptions belong only to the one true God. Yeah, I'm glad I'm doing this that they are tonight because to Christ. The audio because nor is there any force in that cavil makes that this boring, God tedious God task a little to more interesting. Because he is the brightness of his glory. For since the name Jehovah is used in each of these passages, it follows that in respect of his deity, he is self-existent. For if he is Jehovah, he cannot be denied to be the same God, who in another place proclaims by Isaiah, "I am the first, and I am the last, and beside me there is no God." That passage in Jeremiah also deserves our attention. The gods that have not made the heavens and the earth, even they shall perish from the earth and from under these heavens. Whilst on the contrary, it must be acknowledged that the deity of the Son of God is frequently proved by Isaiah from the creation of the world. But how shall the Creator, who gives existence to all, not be self-existent but derive his essence from another? 
For okay. whoever asserts that the Son owes his essence to the Father denies him to be self-existent. But this is contradicted by the Holy Spirit, who gives him the name of Jehovah. Whoops. Now, if we admit the whole essence to be solely in the Father, either it will be divisible, or it will be taken away from the Son. And so, being despoiled of his essence, he will only be a titular God. The divine essence, according to these triflers, belongs solely to the Father, inasmuch as he alone possesses it, and is the author of the essence of the Son. Thus, the divinity of the Son will be a kind of emanation from the essence of God, or a derivation of a part from the whole. Now, they must of necessity concede from their own premises that the Spirit is the Spirit of the Father only, because if he be a derivation from the original essence, which belongs exclusively to the Father, he cannot be accounted the Spirit of the Son, which is refuted by the testimony of Paul, where he makes him common to Christ and the Father. Besides, if the person of the Father be expunged from the Trinity, wherein will he differ from the Son and Spirit, but in being himself the sole deity? They confess that Christ is God and yet differs from the Father. Some distinctive character is necessary also to discriminate the Father from the Son. They who place this in the essence manifestly destroy the true deity of Christ, which cannot exist independently of the essence, that is, of the entire essence. The Father certainly cannot differ from the Son, unless he have something peculiar to himself, which is not common to the Son. What will they find by which to distinguish him? If the difference be in the essence, let them tell us whether he has communicated the same to the Son. But this could not be done partially, for it would be an abomination to fabricate a demigod. Besides, this would miserably dismember the divine essence. The necessary conclusion, then, is that it is entirely and perfectly common to the Father and the Son. And if this be true, there we cannot, go. in respect of the essence, be any somewhere. difference between them. If it be objected that the Father, notwithstanding this communication of his essence, uh -huh. remains the only God with whom the essence continues, then Christ must be a figurative God, a God in appearance and name only, not in reality, because nothing is more proper to God than to be. According to that declaration, I mm, am no hath sent me unto you. We might uh, readily prove from many passages the falsehood of their assumption that whenever the name of God is mentioned absolutely in the scripture, it means only the Father. And in those places which they cite in their own defense, they shamefully betray their ignorance, since the Son is there added, from which it appears that the name of God is used in a relative sense and therefore is particularly restricted to the person of the Father. Their objection that unless the Father alone were the true God, hey. he would himself be his own Father, is answered in a word. For there is no All right, Shiggy Domain, thanks for stopping by. For Maybe I'll check you out. Order being peculiarly given to him, who not only hath begotten of himself his own wisdom, but is also the God of the Mediator, oh, of which I well. shall treat more at large in its proper place. For since Christ was right manifested in the flesh, he is called the Son of God, not only as he was the eternal word begotten of the Father before this. time began, but because he assumed the person and office of a mediator to unite us to God. And since they so presumptuously exclude the Son from divine honors, I would wish to be informed, when he declares that there is none good but the one God, whether he deprives himself of all goodness. I speak not of his human nature, lest they should object that whatever goodness it had, it was gratuitously conferred on it. I demand whether the eternal word of God be good or not. If they answer in the negative, they are sufficiently convicted of impiety. And if in the affirmative, they cut the throat of their own system. But though, at the first glance, Christ seems again. to deny himself the appellation of good, he furnishes, notwithstanding, a further confirmation of our opinion. For as that is a title which peculiarly belongs to the one God, forasmuch as he had been saluted as good, merely according to a common custom, by his rejection of false honor, he suggested that the goodness which he possessed was divine. I demand also, when Paul affirms uh. that God alone is immortal, wise, and true, whether he thereby degrades Christ Got to the rank of, of those it. who this are mortal, pretty unwise, and false. Shall not he, then, be immortal, who from the beginning was life itself, and the giver of immortality to angels? Fill it up over here a little more. Shall not he be wise, who Thank is the goodness. eternal wisdom of God? Shall not he be true, who is truth itself? I demand further whether they think that Christ ought to be worshipped. For if he justly claims this as his right, that every knee should bow before him, it follows that he is that one God, who in the law prohibited the worship of anyone but himself. <laughs> 
if they will have this passage in Isaiah, I am, and there is no God besides me, to be understood solely of the Father, I retort this testimony on themselves, since we see that whatever belongs to God is attributed to Christ. Nor is there any room for their cavil that Christ was exalted in the humanity in which he had been abased, and that with regard to his humanity all power was given to him in heaven and in earth, because, although the regal and judicial majesty extends to the whole person of the mediator, yet had he not been God manifested in the flesh, he could not have been exalted to such an eminence without God being in opposition to himself. And Paul excellently determines this controversy by informing us that he was equal with God before he abased himself under the form of a servant. Now, how could this equality subsist unless he had been the God whose name is Jah and Jehovah, who rides on the cherubim whose kingdom is universal and everlasting? No clamor of theirs can deprive Christ of another declaration of Isaiah. Lo, this is our God, we have waited for him. Isaiah. Since in these words he describes the advent of God the Redeemer, not only for the deliverance of the people from exile in Babylon, but also for the complete restoration okay. of the church. Oh, we lost a sponge over there. Shame. Nor do they gain anything by another right. cavil that oh, Christ was this. God in his Father. For although we confess in point of order and degree that the Father is the fountain of the deity, yet we pronounce it a detestable figment that the essence belongs exclusively to the Father, as though he were the author of the deity of the Son, so because tough. on this supposition either the essence would be divided, or Christ would be only a titular and imaginary God. If they admit that the Son is God, but inferior to the Father, then in him the essence must be begotten and created, Ooh, which in there. the Father is unbegotten go quick. and uncreated. I know that some scorners ridicule our concluding a distinction of persons from the words of Moses, where he introduces God thus speaking, Let us make man in our image. Yet pious readers perceive how frigidly and foolishly oh. Moses would have introduced this conference if in one God there we they go. had not subsisted yeah, you a just plurality of it. persons. Now, it is certain that they whom the Father addressed were uncreated, there. but there is nothing uncreated except the one God himself. Nice. Okay. Now, therefore, unless they grant that Next the power time should to create finish it off. and the authority to command were common to the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, it will follow that God did not speak thus within himself, but directed his conversation yeah, to some multiple exterior ones down before it refills. Lastly, one thing. place will easily remove their two objections at once. For when Christ himself declares that God is a spirit, it would be unreasonable to restrict this solely to the Father, as though the word were not also of a spiritual nature. But if the name of Spirit is equally as applicable to the Son as to the Father, I conclude that the Son is comprehended under the indefinite name of God. Yet he immediately subjoins that none are approved worshippers of the Father, but those who worship him in spirit and in truth. Oh, that's nice. Whence follows another consequence, that because Christ performs the office of a teacher, in a station of inferiority, he ascribes the name of God to the Father, not to destroy his own deity, but by degrees to raise us to the knowledge of it. But they deceive themselves in dreaming of three separate individuals, each of them possessing a part of the divine essence. We teach, according to the scriptures, that there is essentially but one God, yes. and therefore <laughs> that the essence of both the Son and the, the Spirit is unbegotten. But since the Father is first we in got order it this and time. hath of it's himself all begotten his it's wisdom, all one layer now. therefore, as has before been observed, so he is justly right esteemed the trip. original and fountain of the whole divinity. Thus God indefinitely is unbegotten, and the Father also is unbegotten with regard to his person. They even foolishly suppose that our opinion implies a quaternity, whereas they are guilty of falsehood and calumny in ascribing to us a figment of their own as though we pretended that the three persons are as so many streams proceeding from one essence, when it is evident from our writings that we separate not the persons from the essence, but, though they subsist in it, make a distinction between them. If the persons were separated from the essence, there would perhaps be some probability in their argument. But then there would be a trinity of gods, not a trinity of persons contained in one god. This solves their frivolous question whether the essence concurs to the formation of the Trinity, as though we imagined three gods to descend from it. Their objection, that then the Trinity would be without God, is equally impertinent, because, though it concurs not to the distinction as a part or member, yet the persons are not independent of it, nor separate from it, 
for the Father, unless he were God, could not be the Father, and the Son is the Son only as he is God. Therefore we say that the Deity is absolutely self-existent, whence we confess also that the Son as God, independently of the consideration of person, right, is self-existent. But as the Son, we say that he is of the Father. Thus, his essence is unoriginated, but the origin of his person is nice. God himself. And indeed, the Orthodox writers who have written on the Trinity have referred this name only to the persons, since to comprehend the essence in that distinction were not only an absurd error, but a most gross impiety. Finally! For it is evident Bingo. that those who maintain that the Trinity consists in a union of the essence, the Son and the Spirit, annihilate the essence of the Son and the Spirit. Otherwise the parts would be destroyed by being confounded together, which is a fault in every distinction. Finally, if the words Father and God were synonymous, if the Father were the author of the Deity, nothing would be left in the Son but a mere shadow, nor would the Trinity be any other than a conjunction of the one God with two created things. Their objection that Christ, if he be properly God, is not rightly called the Son of God, has already been answered, for when a comparison is made between one person and another, the word God is not used indefinitely, but is restricted to the Father, as being the fountain of the deity, Oops. not with regard to the essence, as fanatics falsely pretend, but in respect of order. This is the sense in which we ought to understand that declaration of Christ to his Father. This is life eternal that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. For speaking in the capacity of mediator, he holds an intermediate station between God and men, yet without any diminution of his majesty. For although he abased himself, yet he lost not his glory with the Father, which was hidden from the world. Thus the apostle to the Hebrews, though he acknowledges that Christ was made for a short time inferior to the angels, yet nevertheless hesitates not to assert, that he is the eternal God who laid the foundation of the Always earth. Always a pain to empty these things We out. must remember, therefore, that whenever Christ, in the capacity of mediator, addresses the Father, he comprehends, under the name of God, the divinity which belongs also to himself. Thus, when he said to his apostles, I go unto the Father, for my Father is greater than I, he attributes not to himself a secondary divinity, as if he were inferior to the Father with respect to the eternal essence, but because, having obtained the glory of heaven, he gathers together the faithful to a participation of it with him. He represents the Father to be in a station superior to himself, just as the illustrious perfection of the splendor which appears in heaven excels that degree of glory which was visible in him during his incarnate state. For the same reason, Paul says in another place that Christ shall deliver up the kingdom to God, even the Father, that God may be all in all. Nothing would be more absurd than to deny perpetual duration to the deity of Christ. Now, if he will never cease to be the Son of God, but will remain forever the same as he has been from the beginning, it follows that by the name Father is intended the one sole divine essence, which is common to them both. And it is certain that Christ descended to us in order that, exalting us to the Father, he might at the same time exalt us to himself also, as being one with the Father. It is therefore neither lawful nor right to restrict the name of God exclusively to the Father, and to deny it to the Son. For even on this very account John asserts him to be the true God, that no one might suppose that he possessed only a secondary degree of deity inferior to the Father. Mm. And I wonder what can be the meaning of these fabricators of new gods when, after confessing that Christ is the true God, they immediately exclude him from the deity of the Father, as though there could be any true God but one alone, or as though a transfused divinity were anything but a novel fiction. Their accumulation of numerous passages from Irenaeus, where he asserts the Father of Christ to be the only and eternal God of Israel, is a proof either of shameful ignorance or of consummate wickedness, for they ought to have considered that that holy man was then engaged in a controversy with some madman who denied that the Father of Christ was the same God that has spoken by Moses and the prophets, but maintained that he was, I know not what sort of phantasm, produced from the corruption hey, Alan, of the how world. We doing? His only object we therefore, are is to show that out no a water other God is revealed in the scripture than the Father while listening of Christ, to John Calvin. That's and what that we're doing. <laughs> it is impious to imagine Ooh, any other, and therefore we need not wonder at his frequently concluding that there never was any other God of Israel than he who was preached by Christ and his apostles. Burr, burr, burr. 
We finally so got rid of all the, the water, hand, pretty much. When a different era is to be opposed, we shall truly assert that the god who appeared formerly to the patriarchs was no other than Christ. If it be objected that it was the Father, we are prepared to reply that while we contend for the divinity of the Son, we by no means reject that of the Father. If the reader attends to this design of Irenaeus, all contention will cease. Moreover, the whole controversy is easily decided by the sixth chapter of the third book, where the good man insists on this one point, that he who is absolutely and indefinitely called God in the scripture is the only true God, but that the name of God is given absolutely to Christ. Let us remember that the point at issue, as appears from the whole treatise, and particularly from the forty-sixth chapter of the second book, was this, that the appellation of Father is not given in an enigmatical and parabolical sense parabolical. to one who is not truly God. Besides, in another place he contends that the Son is called God as well as the Father by the prophets and apostles. He afterwards states how Christ, who is Lord and King and God and Judge of all, received power from him who is God of all, and that is with relation to the subjection in which he was humbled even to the death of the cross. And a little after he affirms that the Son is the creator of heaven and earth, who gave the law by the hand of Moses and appeared to the patriarchs. Now, if anyone pretends that Irenaeus acknowledges the Father alone as the God of Israel, I shall reply, as is clearly maintained by the same writer, that Christ is one and the same, as also he applies to him the prophecy of Habakkuk, God shall come yeah. from the south. The word Father and God. To the same purpose yeah, I mean, is what we the find Father in the is God, so there's not the necessarily book. anything wrong Therefore with that. Christ him. But, um, yeah, the Father is God, but there are three persons in the Trinity, so, like, so, so like, uh, I don't know. It, you can use them interchangeably. It just depends whether or not you speak of all the persons the same way. Yeah. <clears throat> do do do. Unless you meant something else by that, Peter C. Get this working. Self is with go. the Father, the God of the living. And in the twelfth chapter of the same book, he states that Abraham believed in God, inasmuch as Christ is the creator of heaven and earth, and the only God. Their pretensions to the sanction of Tertullian are equally unfounded, for, notwithstanding the occasional harshness and obscurity of his mode of expression, <laughs> yet he unequivocally teaches the substance of the doctrine which we are defending. That is, so saying, that whereas there is one confusing? God, yet by dispensation or economy, I don't know, I haven't really read Tertullian. Word, that there is but one God in the unity of the substance, but that the unity by a mysterious dispensation... One entity of the Trinity? Well, he's one person... He's one person of the three in the Trinity, so you're right, if that's what you mean. Um, but they're not separate beings. They're persons within the one being of God. And so they all are worthy of being called fully God. They all fully share the deity. And so, yeah, the Father is God, and Jesus calls him his God. And so those are all proper ways to speak. You can find all of that in Scripture, but... Yeah, it is easy to say something, though, and not know what you mean by it, um, if that makes sense. Is disposed into a trinity, that there are three, not in condition, but in degree, not in substance, but in form, not in power, but in order. He mm -hmm. says, indeed, that he maintains the Son to be second to the Father, but he applies this only to the distinction of the persons. He says somewhere that the Son is visible, but after having stated arguments on both sides, he concludes that as the Word, he is invisible. Lastly, his assertion that the Father is designated by his person proves him to be at the greatest distance from the notion which we are refuting. And though he acknowledges no other... Yeah, I can see like where you might be confused there, Peter C., because... Yeah, I don't know if you were going to say something else, but I'm, I keep thinking about your comments as we go. But yeah, when we think... It is easy to see why you might not want to call like one person of the Trinity God, even though you should. Um, because often we think of like, if there are three persons within the being of God, sharing the being of God, we tend to compare that to like a physical being. 
like uh the fa- like I have a body like my arm is the father, my other arm is the son, and then my leg is the spirit. Like they're parts in that way, but that's not quite right with the spiritual being. They don't, you know, the being of God is infinite. Um, and they're not splitting it up like a substance, uh, like a physical substance. Like they all have all of it. And so it, it's, it's hard to think of it that way because it's a spiritual reality and we want to compare it to something physical. And so the father is fully God and the son is fully God. The spirit is fully God. And so they're all worthy of being called God and you can refer to them as God individually. Um, but they are members of the Trinity. And so like the Trinity can also be called God. And so it's, it's unlike any other God is unlike any other being. And you can speak of him in all of those ways. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, I don't think it's a problem for someone, as you were saying, to, to call the father God. Um, but you, it, but it's not intuitive. The Trinity is a difficult doctrine. Yeah. I hope that made some sense. That's my best understanding anyways. God than the Father, yet the explanations which he gives in the immediate context show that he speaks not to the exclusion of the Son when he denies the existence of any other God than the Father, and that therefore the unity of divine government is not violated by the distinction of persons. And from the nature and design of his argument it is easy to gather the meaning of his words. For he contends in opposition to Praxius that although God is distinguished into three persons, Yet neither is there a plurality of gods, nor is the unity divided. And because, according to the erroneous notion of Praxius, Christ could not be God without being the Father, therefore Tertullian bestows so much labor upon the distinction. His calling the word and spirit a portion of the whole, though a harsh expression, yet is excusable, since it has no reference to the substance, but only denotes the disposition and economy, which belongs solely to the persons, according to the testimony of Tertullian himself. Hence also that question, how many persons suppose you that there are, O most perverse Praxius, but as many as there are names? So, a little after, that they may believe the Father and the Son, both in their names and persons. These arguments, I conceive, will suffice to refute the impudence of those who make use of the authority of Tertullian impudence. in order to deceive the minds of the simple. And certainly, whoever will diligently compare the writings of the fathers will find in Irenaeus nothing different from what was advanced by others these? who succeeded him. Justin Martyr is one of the most Whoops. ancient, and he agrees with us in every point. They may object that the Father of Christ is denominated the one God by him, as well as by the rest. The same is asserted also by Hilary, and even in harsher terms, he says, the eternity mm -hmm. is in the Father. Yeah, it's a tough balance, Peter C. It's, um... This, uh, Calvin actually said it at the beginning here where he's like, there are some who say we should only use biblical vocabulary without using an a non-biblical word like Trinity. Um, it's a word that developed basically as a summation of what scripture is clear about. Like, I'd say there's a mystery in regard to how the Trinity works, but not whether it works. I mean, it is... Uh, De fide is actually what you might call it. And it's of the faith. It is founda a foundational, like non-negotiable doctrine of the Christian faith. But um, there is mystery contained in it. It's just, um, it's not a, it's a mystery how it's true, but it's not a mystery whether it's true. And so it's, it's, it's important to differentiate between the two. And so like the theological work done on it, like this one is, um, it's important. I'd say it's correct, but, uh, you can see how careful Calvin is with a lot of his vocabulary. He's like, I'm going to say this much because scripture clearly demonstrates this, but I'm not going to say more. He says stuff like that all the time. And that's a difficult balance beam to walk where it's like, I don't want to be silent where scripture has clearly said something. And it has clearly said the things he's pointed out, but then we don't want to keep speaking. Like we understand more than what was revealed to us. And it takes some discernment to know when you've crossed that line. Yeah. But does this imply a denial of the divine essence to the Son? On the contrary, he had no other design than to maintain the same faith which we hold. Nevertheless, they are not ashamed to cull out mutilated passages in order to induce a belief that he patronized their error. 
if they wish any authority to be attached to their quotation of ignatius let them prove that the apostles delivered any law concerning lent and similar corruptions for nothing can be more absurd than the impertinencies which have been published under the name of ignatius <laughs> wherefore their impudence is more intolerable who disguise themselves under such false colours for the purpose of deception moreover the consent of antiquity manifestly appears from this circumstance that in the nicene council arius never dared to defend himself by the authority of any approved writer and not one of the greek or latin fathers who were there united against him excused himself as at all dissenting from his predecessors with regard to augustine who experienced great hostility from these disturbers his diligent examination of all the writings of the earlier fathers and his respectful attention to them need not be mentioned Augustine. if he differs from them in the smallest particulars he assigns the reasons which oblige him to dissent from them on this argument also if he finds anything Ooh, ambiguous or obscure in others he never conceals it yet Storage he takes it for granted here. that the doctrine which those men oppose have to get more has been received without controversy from the remotest antiquity and yet that he was not uninformed of what others had taught before him appears even from one word in the first book of his treatise on the christian doctrine where he says that unity is in the father will they pretend that he had then forgotten himself but he elsewhere vindicates himself from this calumny where he calls the father the fountain of the whole deity because he is from no other wisely considering that the name of god is especially ascribed to the father because unless the original be from him it is impossible to conceive of the simple unity of the deity these observations i hope will be approached by the pious reader as right. sufficient to refute all the calumnies with which satan has hitherto yeah i think that's a good way of putting it peter or obscure C. the purity of this doctrine Finally, I trust that the whole substance of this doctrine has been faithfully stated and explained, provided my readers set bounds to their curiosity and are not unreasonably fond of tedious and intricate controversies. Yeah, see how he, this For is he saying what I'm saying. I have the least expectation of giving satisfaction to the... He's like, it's like, hopefully, I'm set, I've plainly stated the doctrine and no one goes further with, like, more perverse curiosity. He has to stop himself sometimes. Yeah, right. Those who are pleased with an intemperance of speculation. I am sure. Those who are pleased with an intemperance of speculation. That's like the negative trait he describes. That's, that's so funny. I have used no artifice in the omission of anything from a supposition that it would make against me. But studying the edification of the church, I have thought it better not to touch upon many things which would be unnecessarily burdensome to the reader without yielding him any profit for to what purpose is it to dispute whether the father be always begetting for it is foolish to imagine a continual act of generation since it is evident that three persons have subsisted in god from all eternity chapter fourteen the true god clearly distinguished in the scripture from all fictitious ones by the creation of the world uh -huh. all right so Although there's Isaiah i think it, that's the end of his um statements strictly on the trinity let me go back to the table of contents here we could start another topic but uh i need to actually look up i need to look up uh the table of contents here calvin's institutes wait a second calvin's institutes uh table of contents here we go I think I saw like the whole PDF somewhere. Banner of Truth. Let's see. Pretty sure there's just a whole PDF of it that I looked at somewhere. Let's just do this. Here we go. All right. I just want to see the table of contents. Uh, so let's see. Chapter one, the knowledge of God and of ourselves mutually connected. What is it is to know God? Tendency of this knowledge. Let's see. Uh, let's see here. The knowledge of God stifled or corrupted. We could get into predestination. Oh boy. Kelvin on that is just deep stuff. <laughs> the credibility of scripture sufficiently, sufficiently proved in so far as natural reason admits, uh, all the principles of piety subverted by fanatics who substitute revelations for scripture. Uh-huh. 
Oh, so he's probably talking about, um, is he talking about the Anabaptists? He probably is. Um, the true God opposed exclusively. Let's see. There's a lot here. Unity of the divine essence. Uh huh. State in which man was created, the faculties of the soul, the image of God, free will, original righteousness. Hmm. The world created by God. Let's see. Used to be made of the doctrine of providence. Ooh. Ooh, general providence is a fun thing to hear him on. Let me see here. Oh, ooh. Chapter 17. That's going to be some good stuff. Hold on a second here. Chapter, is it still, is that still book one? I think it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh-huh. Okay, just a second here. The arguments, uh. <laughs> All right. Providence will be fun. Chapter 17. I just got to find it. Book one. 16.3 through 17.14. What's 16.3? Okay. Still cherished and protected by... Okay, let's go, to, let's go to 16 here. Yeah, this is the one. This is what we want. Section 6 of Institutes of the Christian Religion. Alvin, translated by John Allen. This LibriVox I wonder if I can, uh, in the public domain. this is actually book streaming. One, chapter 16, section 3, to book 1, chapter 17, section 14. Oh good, I can pause and it. Indeed, God asserts his possession of omnipotence and claims our acknowledgement of this attribute. Might be quieter than... As is imagined by sophists. You know what? Idle and almost asleep. But Might be too quiet. Hold on a second. ...operative and engaged in continual action... Just a minute here. Not a mere general principle of confused motion, as if he should command a river to flow through the channels once made for it, but a power constant. I'm going to download it just so I know the volume's right. Because I think the volume's different for you guys, depending whether I'm playing it through the browser versus... Uh... That sounds good. Did it sound the same? Well, let me see. I'd prefer to have it on my computer. So It's only got 30 seconds, then we'll just start it there. That'd be cool. So, like I like my consistency. All right. Yeah, this one's going quick. <clears throat> but boy, we have uh, accomplished a lot in game here. We are coming down to it with this. We've kept the lights in place, but I'm eventually going to have to go through and get rid of them all. Or I've got my silk touch so I can keep them just got to be really careful not to break any this pickaxe lasts forever all right download is done so let's do it here we go section six of institutes of the christian religion by right. john calvin translated by john allen this librivox recording is in the public domain Book 1, chapter Robidence. 16, section 3, to Book 1, chapter 17, section 14. And, indeed, God asserts his possession of omnipotence and claims our acknowledgement of this attribute, not such as is imagined yeah, he's by he's starting surfists. kind of midway Vain, through, uh, and almost asleep, but vigilant, to switch efficacious, back. operative, and engaged in continual action. Not a mere general principle. He's of starting midway through motion, chapter sixteen, as but it's not that a far. To flow through the channels once made for it, but a power constantly exerted on every distant and particular movement. For he is accounted omnipotent, not because he is able to act, yet sits down in idleness, or continues by a general instinct the order of nature originally appointed by him, but because he governs heaven and earth by his providence and regulates all things in such a manner that nothing happens but according to his counsel. For when it is said in the Psalms that he does whatsoever he pleases. Yes, and this is, where, this is what people know Calvin for, is his strong doctrine of um, God's sovereignty and providence over all things, um, particularly salvation. So you, 
the Trinity is like universal Christian doctrine, but this stuff is what makes Calvinism specifically Calvinistic. <laughs> is uh, is this stuff pleases? It denotes his certain and deliberate will. For it would be quite insipid to expound the words of the prophet in the philosophical manner that God is the prime agent because he is the principle and cause of all motion, whereas the faithful should rather encourage themselves in adversity with this consolation that they suffer no affliction but by the ordination and command of God, because they are under his hand. But if the government of God be thus extended to all his works, it is a puerile cavil to limit it to the influence and course of nature. And they not only defraud God of his glory, but themselves of a very useful doctrine, who can find the divine providence within such narrow bounds as though he permitted all things to proceed in an uncontrolled course, according to a perpetual law of nature. For nothing would exceed the misery of man, if he were exposed to all the motions of the heaven, air, earth, and waters. Besides, this notion would shamefully diminish the singular goodness of God towards every individual. David exclaims that infants, yet hanging on the breasts of their mothers, are sufficiently eloquent to celebrate the glory of God, because, as soon as they are born, they find aliment prepared for them by his heavenly care. This, indeed, is generally true, yet it cannot escape the observation of our eyes and senses, being evidently proved by experience that some mothers have breasts full and copious, but others almost dry, as it pleases God to provide more liberally for one, but more sparingly for another. But they who ascribe just praise to the divine omnipotence receive from this a double advantage. In the first place, he must have ample ability to bless them, who possesses heaven and earth, and whose will all the creatures regard so as to devote themselves to his service. And secondly, they may securely repose in his protection, to whose will are subject all those evils which can be feared from any quarter, by whose power Satan is restrained with all his furies and all his machinations on whose will depends all that is inimical to our safety, nor is there anything else by which those immoderate and superstitious fears which we frequently feel on the sight of dangers can be corrected or appeased. We are superstitiously timid, I say, if, whenever creatures menace or terrify us, we are frightened as though they had of themselves the power to hurt us, or could fortuitously injure us, or as if against their injuries God were unable to afford us sufficient aid, for example, the prophet forbids the children of God to fear the stars and signs of heaven, as is the custom of unbelievers. He certainly condemns not every kind of fear. But when infidels transfer the government of the world from God to the stars, pretending that their happiness or misery depends on the decrees and precedents... Going after the astrologist. I'm a Pisces, that means something or other. <laughs> yeah, he's uh, making some application. The stars don't control you. ...messages of the stars, and not on the will of God. The consequence is that their fear is withdrawn from him, whom alone they ought to regard, and is placed on stars and comets. Whoever then desires to avoid this infidelity, let him constantly remember that in the creatures there is no erratic power, or action, or motion, but that they are so governed by the secret counsel of God, that nothing can happen but what is subject to his knowledge, and decreed by his will. First, then, let the readers know that what is called providence describes God, not as idly beholding from heaven the transactions which happen in the world, but as holding the helm of the universe and regulating all events. Thus it belongs no less to his hands than to his eyes. When Abraham said to his son, God will provide, he intended not only to assert his prescience of a future event, but to leave the care of a thing unknown to the will of him who frequently puts an end to circumstances of perplexity and confusion. Whence it follows that providence consists in action, for it is ignorant trifling to talk of mere prescience. Mm. Not quite so great. Yeah, so he's saying it's beyond God just knowing what comes to pass. Because that makes him passive, but he's active in all things. Gross is the error of those who attribute to God a government, as I have observed, of a confused and promiscuous kind, acknowledging that God revolves and impels the machine of the world with all its parts by a general motion, without peculiarly directing the action of each individual creature. Yet even this error is not to be tolerated. 
for they maintain that this providence, which they call universal, is no impediment either to all the creatures being actuated contingently, or to man turning himself hither and thither at the free choice of hither his own and hither. And they make the following partition between God and man, that God, by his power, inspires him with motions, enabling him to act according to the tendency of the nature with which he is endued, but that man governs his actions by his own voluntary choice. In short, they conceive that the world, human affairs, and men themselves are governed by the power of God, but not by his appointment. Mm. I speak not of the Epicureans, who have always infested the world, who dream of a god <laughs> absorbed in sloth and inactivity, and of others no less erroneous, who formally pretend that the dominion of God extended over the middle region of the air, but that he left inferior things to fortune, since the mute creatures themselves sufficiently exclaim against such evidence. He's just arguing against this idea that there's like this set of things that God has left up to chance. It's interesting, because like some will say, like, well, he made this thing, but then he, he basically made a machine and then let it set it in motion and then leaves it alone. He says, no, like, I think he's probably eventually going to quote, you know, like Matthew, where it says, um, uh, what does it say? Not a single, not a bird falls from the air apart from Apart from your father in heaven. Let me see here. Stupidity. There we go. My Stupidity. present design is to refute that opinion which has almost generally prevailed, which, conceding to God a sort of blind and uncertain motion, deprives him of the principal thing, which is his directing and disposing, by his incomprehensible wisdom, all things to their proper end. And thus, robbing God of the government of the world, it makes him the ruler of it in name only, and not in reality. For, pray, what is governing, but presiding in such a manner as to rule by fixed decrees those over whom you preside? Yet I reject not altogether what they assert concerning universal providence, provided they, on their part, admit that God governs the world, not merely because he preserves the order of nature fixed by himself, but because he exercises a peculiar care over every one of his works. It is true that all things are actuated by a secret instinct of nature, as though they obeyed the eternal command of God, and that what God has once appointed appears to proceed from voluntary inclination in the creatures. And to this may be referred the declaration of Christ that his Father and himself had always been working even from the beginning, and the assertion of Paul that in him we live and move and have our being, and also what is observed by the author of the epistle to the Hebrews with a design to prove the divinity of Christ, that all things are sustained by the word of his power. Hmm. But they act very improperly in concealing and obscuring by this pretext the doctrine of a particular providence, which is asserted in such plain and clear testimonies of scripture that it is surprising how anyone could entertain a doubt concerning it. And certainly they who conceal it with this veil which I have mentioned are obliged to correct themselves by adding that many things happen through the peculiar care of God, but this they erroneously restrict to some particular acts. Wherefore we have to prove that God attends to the government of particular events, Oops, and that they all proceed one. from his determinate counsel, Darn it. in such a manner that there can be no such thing as fortuitous contingents. Fortuitous if we grant that the principle of motion originates from God, this is saying there's no such that all thing as are spontaneously or accidentally carried whither the bias of nature impels them, the mutual vicissitudes of day and night, of winter and summer, will be the work of God, inasmuch as he has distributed to each its respective parts and prescribed to them a certain law. That is, this would be the case if, with even tenor, they always observed the same measure, days succeeding to nights, months to months, and years to years. But sometimes excessive heats and drought parch and burn the fruits of the earth, sometimes unseasonable rains injure the crops of corn, and sudden calamities are occasioned by showers of hail and storms. This will not be the work of God, unless, perhaps, as either clouds or serene weather, or cold or heat, derive their origin from the opposition of the stars and other natural causes. Mr. Beast has fallen but from this grace. this representation leaves no room for God to display or exercise his paternal favor or his judgments. If they say that God is sufficiently beneficent... Ah, but Calvin hasn't reached that part yet, Mr. Peter C. Read you some Romans 9. It's challenging stuff. 
<clears throat> I think Calvin would agree only insofar as he would say, like, you can't ever attribute evil to God. He would always say that. But he still has way more control than you think in that. So, for instance, biggest example in scripture probably is Pharaoh, where it says God hardened his heart. Um, and it's like, you see this multiple times. I think Isaiah, Isaiah 10 is one of them. It talks about like, uh, Assyria being the, the ax in his hand to punish Israel to the point where it's like, they're exercising evil intentions and attacking Israel. And yet they are carrying out the just, the judgment of God at the same time. And then God turns around and punishes them for the evil intentions of their heart. And so it almost seems contradictory where it's like they did exactly what God wanted them to do. And yet they're also responsible for what they did. And Calvin goes nuts. Like, ex like showing examples in scripture like that is pretty amazing, but it's like a lot of people don't put the, put them together. Age of accountability. Yeah. I, I wouldn't say it's a biblical doctrine. It's a mysterious thing in that, um, like, simply the fact that death can ever come upon an infant, for instance, means that, like, you can see this sort of talked about in Romans 5, there is, um, clearly sin affects everyone. And not only that, but, like, uh, Paul parallels our, our um, guilt in Adam with our righteousness in Christ. And so it's, it's kind of important not to sort of separate a certain age out as if it's not affected by sin or accountability. At the same time, that does raise the question of, you know, what happens to those who die before they're even like conscious of their sin, their sin nature. Um, I think there's good arguments in scripture to say that um, there may be good reason to believe that those who die in infancy are... Um, are saved, but it's not because they don't have a sin nature. If they are saved, it's going to be through Christ that is still needed for them. Um, but there's, there's a lot you could read on it. I just simply don't buy into a simple, a simple like idea of an age of accountability because, because it's not explicitly stated in scripture like that. And because it does kind of mess with the important doctrine of understanding the sin nature. Um, those are sort of my messy thoughts on it, at least. Um, but yeah, a lot of people tend to want to believe in that, but and I can see why. Um, but those are my sort of initial thoughts on it. Percent to man because he infuses into heaven and earth an ordinary power by which they supply him with food. It is a very flimsy and profane notion, as though the fecundity of one year were not the same benediction of God, and as though penury and famine were not his malediction and vengeance. But, as it would be tedious to collect all the reasons for rejecting this error, let us be content with the authority of God himself. In the law and in the prophets he frequently declares that whenever he moistens the earth with dew or with rain, he affords a testimony of his favour, and that, on the contrary, when, at his command, heaven becomes hard as iron, when the crops of corn are blasted and otherwise destroyed, and when showers of hail and storms molest mm -hmm. the field, what about holding ourselves accountable for our own movement towards and away from God's will? So there's two ways you can talk about God's will. This is often the way like reformed theologians like Calvin or people who learn from Calvin. Um, and I, I, I don't want to speak like those who are reformed kind of like worship Calvin, like he's the standard of doctrine, but um, being like Calvinistic or reformed tends to mean that you think his interpretations of scripture are generally sound. <clears throat> and I would generally agree with that. Um, there's two ways you could talk about God's will. And it, it, the funny thing is like in the context of arguing over sovereignty and Calvinism and things like that and predestination, um, people tend to want to disagree with the idea of two different kinds of speaking of God's will, but we all do it. And so the best example of this is, um, uh, the cross for instance, but the two ways you talk about God's will are God's will of command and his will of decree in that his will of command is like the commandments that we obey or break every day. And that's true. You can go against the 
will of God in the sense of his will of command. Um, but it's not that it's not just as simple as that, because we all believe that the cross was predestined by God. That's like a basic Christian doctrine. It was prophesied in Isaiah 53. It pleased the Lord to crush him. God was crucifying Christ for our sins. That's, that's the Christian doctrine and Calvinists and non-Calvinists agree on that. But if that's the case, you have to take into account the fact that he used individuals to carry it out. It was a sin to murder Christ. So there you have God's will of command, thou shalt not murder, right? But he predestined the murder of his son and carried out our redemption through that murder. And so, and they were accountable for murdering him. Um, and so you have God's will of command, you know, being broken there, but his will of decree, what he decreed from eternity being fulfilled at the same time. And those, and so the Calvinist sort of position is that those two um, types of God's will are being, are, are present always. And so human beings are accountable and yet somehow he's overruling and writing history through all of that. Uh, and it's like, and the Bible doesn't like split the difference between the two. It's like a, 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 a crazy mystery. Um, and that's one example. People like maybe say, well, there's an exception with the cross, but this happens all the time in the Bible. And I would say that is the basic state of affairs. Um, but, uh, Calvin's about to describe even more of it. So give it a listen. But let's see here. He gives a proof of his certain and special vengeance. If we believe these things, it is certain that not a drop of rain falls mm -hmm. but at the express command of God. David indeed. Yeah, but you, you made a specific point there, Peter C., though, about uh, holding ourselves accountable. Um, and that's important. But one thing that's important is, again, this is something Calvin focuses on in another chapter. Um concerning our depravity, we are accountable for our actions. That is true. But at the same time, we often say we're accountable in the sense of having like a, a completely autonomous will, but we have to ask the, the way in which our sin nature affects our will. Um, and in Romans, it says that none seek for God. That's the effect of sin. We're accountable for that, but it's also inevitable that without Christ or without grace intervening, we won't draw near to God. Romans 8 says those who are of the flesh, meaning those who are not saved, cannot please God. Like the, the flesh cannot submit itself to the, to the law of God. Um, and so I would say we're accountable and responsible for when we don't, but, but it's not like we're neutral creatures balancing between good and evil. Apart from grace, we are evil. Jesus calls us evil even. <laughs> Those of you who are evil still know how to give good gifts to your children is how he puts it. Um, and so like, I think the best summary of it is like, we are responsible for our sin, uh, but God is responsible for our redemption. In other words, we don't take credit for when we do draw near to God. That happens because of his divine intervention. Any inclination I have towards God comes from God. Um, and so... Yeah, I think that's a good summary. But I hope that made sense. Um, but I'll, I'll keep listening while you comment. But yeah. Praises the general providence of God because he giveth food to the young ravens which cry. But when God himself threatens animals with famine, does he not plainly declare that he feeds all living creatures, sometimes with a smaller allowance, sometimes with a larger, as he pleases? It is puerile, as I have already observed, to restrain this to particular acts, whereas Christ says, without any exception, that not a sparrow of the least value falls to the ground without the will of the Father. Oh, he quoted it, Certainly, Matt. if the flight of birds be directed by the unerring counsel of God, we must be constrained to confess with the prophet that, though he dwelleth on high, yet he humbleth himself to behold the things which are in heaven and in the earth. But as we know that the world was made chiefly for the sake of mankind, we must also observe this end in the government of it. The prophet Jeremiah exclaims, I know that the way of man is not in himself, it is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. And Solomon, 
man's goings are of the Lord. How can a man then understand his own way? Now let them say that man is actuated by God according to the bias of his nature, but that he directs that influence according to his own pleasure. If this could be asserted with truth, man would have the free choice of his own ways. That, perhaps, they will deny, because he can do nothing independently of the power of God. But, since it is evident that both the prophet and Solomon ascribe to God choice and appointment, as well as power, this by no means extricates them from the difficulty. But Solomon, in another place, beautifully reproves this temerity of men, who predetermine on an end for themselves, without regard to God, as though they were not led by his hand. The preparation of the heart in man, says he, and the answer of the tongue, is from the Lord. It is indeed a ridiculous madness for There's miserable so men to resolve on undertaking like any that. work independently of God, whilst they cannot even speak a word but what he chooses. Moreover, the scripture, more fully to express that nothing is transacted in the world, but according to his destination, shows that those things are subject to him which appear most fortuitous. For what would you be more ready to attribute to chance than when a limb broken off from a tree kills a passing traveller? But very different is the decision of the Lord, who acknowledges that he has delivered him into the hand of the slayer. Who likewise does not leave lots to the blindness of fortune, yet the Lord leaves them not, but claims the disposal of them himself. He teaches us that it is not by any power of their own that lots are cast into the lap and drawn out. But the only thing which could be ascribed to chance, he declares to belong to himself. To the same purpose is another passage from Solomon. The poor and the deceitful man meet together. The Lord enlighteneth the eyes of them both. For although the poor and the rich are blended together in the world, yet, as their respective conditions are assigned to them by divine appointment, he suggests that God, who enlightens all, is not blind and thus exhorts the poor to patience, because those who are discontented with their lot are endeavouring to shake off the burden imposed on them by God. Thus also another prophet Oops. rebukes profane persons who attribute it to human industry or to fortune that some men remain in obscurity and others rise to honours. Promotion cometh neither from the east nor from the west nor from the south, but God is the judge. He putteth down one and setteth up another. Since God cannot divest himself of the office of a judge, hence he reasons that it is from the secret counsel of God that some rise to promotion and others remain in contempt. Moreover, particular events are in general proofs of the special providence of God. God raised in the desert a south wind to convey to the people a large flock of birds. When he would have Jonah thrown into the sea, he sent forth a wind to raise a tempest. It will be said by them who suppose God not to hold the helm of the world that this was a deviation from the common course of things. But the conclusion which I deduce from it is that no wind ever rises or blows but by the special command of God. For otherwise it would not be true that he makes the winds his messengers, and a flame of fire his ministers, that he makes the clouds his chariot, and rides on the wings of the wind. Yeah, Unless... Something I've always thought of, he's talking about God's providence over nature, and it's like we we want to take that, because of the tragedy that can come from nature, we tend to take that out of God's hand and say, well, it's sort of a fallen machine that he's set up, but he's not interacting with it regularly. Um, but the problem with that is we all know that we thank God when we're spared from something like that. We thank God that, um, taking the responsibility of God for ourselves. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I was going to say, uh, yeah, we, we tend to, we, we tend to thank God when we're spared from like a cataclysmic weather event or something, which we should, but once we do that, that concedes that God could have decided otherwise, which means whether you say he's directly causing something or whether he's allowing something, he's still deciding with each event whether he allows it or whether he causes it, which means it's a meticulous providence. And we and that's the only way to think of it if you want to thank him for any anything that comes up comes about. That, that's not just the weather, but like every area of life. Any gift you receive from a human being or or anything, any any good fortune you come up, come across, if you thank God for it, you're assuming he had a say in it. 
Um, and it's, it's amazing. We often don't think about that. Like our prayers are an assumption that that's the case pretty much a hundred percent of the time. <clears throat> we often don't think about the implications of just our basic Christian practices. Sometimes he directed at his pleasure, the course, both of the clouds and of the winds and displayed in them the singular presence of his power. Thus also we are elsewhere taught that whenever the sea is blown into a tempest by the winds, those commotions prove the special presence of God. He commandeth and raiseth the stormy wind, which lifteth up the waves of the sea. Mm, did I finish? Then he maketh the storm a calm, I think so we that may the have waves thereof the main are still. Hollowing out of this As place. in another place he proclaims that he scourged the people with parching winds. Thus, whilst men are naturally endued with a power of generation, yet God will have it acknowledged as the effect of his special favor that he leaves some without any posterity and bestows children on others, for the fruit of the womb is his reward. Therefore Jacob said to his wife, Am I in God's stead, who hath withheld from thee the fruit of the womb? But to conclude, there is nothing more common in nature than for us to be nourished with bread, but the Spirit declares not only that the produce of the earth is the special gift of God, but that men do not live by bread alone, because they are supported not by the abundance of their food, but by the secret benediction of God. Oh, we... As on the contrary, he threatens Don't that he will break over the here. stay of bread. <laughs> Nor indeed could we otherwise seriously we offer a prayer for daily bread left. if God did not supply us with food from his fatherly hand. The prophet, therefore, to convince the faithful that, in feeding them, God acts the part of an excellent father of a family, informs us that he giveth food to all flesh. Lastly, when we hear, on the one hand, that the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are open unto their cry, and on the other, that the face of the Lord is against them that do evil, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth, we may be assured that all creatures, above and below, are ready for his service, that he may apply them to any use he pleases. Hence we conclude not only that there is a general providence of God over the creatures to continue the order of nature, but that by his wonderful counsel they are all directed to some specific and proper end. Proper end. Those who wish to bring an odium on this doctrine calumniate it as the same with the opinion of the Stoics concerning fate, with fate. which Augustine also was formerly reproached. Uh -huh. Though we are averse to all contentions about words, yet we admit not the term fate, both because it is of that novel and profane kind which Paul teaches us to avoid, and because they endeavour to load the truth of God with the odium attached to it. But that dogma is falsely and maliciously charged upon us, for we do not with the Stoics imagine a necessity arising from a perpetual concatenation and intricate series of causes contained in nature, but we make God the arbiter and governor of all things, who, in his own wisdom, has from the remotest eternity decreed what he would do, and now by his own power executes what he has decreed. Whence we assert that not only the heaven and the earth and inanimate creatures, but also the deliberations and volitions of men are so governed by his providence as to be directed to the end appointed by it. What then, you will say, does nothing happen fortuitously or contingently? I answer that for it was truly observed. Praying to God and asking him for something makes me sometimes feel guilty because who am I to ask God to do something that I want when it might defy his will? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. Because it's like, I mean, God is capable of saying no and putting up with our immaturity if we're being selfish about something, you know. He's gracious in that way. So I never would discourage anyone from asking something of God. Um, and, you know, but the thing is, like, if it's not his will, he won't do it. <laughs> That's the thing. So you're not really, you're, you can't ultimately defy his will. And if something is his will, like, it's interesting. If you read Romans 8, it says that the spirit basically interprets our prayers. Um yeah. The spirit is basically interceding for us. Um, which to me means like, you know, God is able to filter out what's coming from our flesh and what's coming from the spirit. Um, 
So I would never feel guilty about praying to God for something, but you can pray at the same time. And Lord, if this is selfish, you know, then change me instead of changing my circumstances. Like that makes sense too. And if he is this sovereign, you know, if he is this, if he has this kind of meticulous providence, then, you know, if he answers a prayer or doesn't answer a prayer, it's going to fulfill his will. And your prayer is often a means of fulfilling his will. Like your pr- the fact that you're praying, if he's this in control, then the fact that you're praying is just as much a part of his plan as the fulfillment or the non-fulfillment. That's the way I like to think of it anyways. By Basil the Great, that fortune and chance are words of the heathen, with the signification of which the minds of the pious ought not to be occupied. For if all success be the benediction of God, and calamity and adversity his malediction, there is no room left in human affairs for fortune or chance. And we should attend to this declaration of Augustine, quote, I am not pleased with myself, says he, for having in my treatises against the academics so frequently mentioned fortune, although I have not intended by that word any goddess, but a fortuitous occurrence of external things, either good or evil. Go. Perhaps also right. such words, the use of which no religion prohibits, as perhaps, perchance, peradventure, which nevertheless must be entirely referred to the divine providence. All right. And on this I so have I'm not been silent, there. remarking... Uh, I often... Let me see here. Let me f- finish up your statement here. I often find myself just ending my prayers with a sentence like, if this is not your will, then please correct me, if that makes sense. No, yeah, me too. And I think that's a good way to put it. It's it's pretty well-established sort of in Christian tradition, at least until recent times, to say, like, God willing. And James says it in that in that way. Like, he says... Not even just in reference to prayers, but he'll say, like, um, often it's presumptuous to say, like, I'm go- I'm going to do such and such next week. He says what you should say is, if God wills. Um, and I suppose it applies to prayer. It says, Lord, if it's your will, then X, Y, and Z. And, you know, in recent times, there's, like, you know, prosperity gospel preachers who say that you have, like, the power to create reality with your words, which is sort of a mixture of New Age beliefs, really. Um, and they basically say you should just speak your reality into existence, but that's, that's not biblical. I think it is perfectly biblical to humble yourself before God and, you know, make your request, but in reference to his will, you know, that's really the balance. Go ahead and make your request. You know, he, he knows what you want before you ask it is what Christ said. And he's perfectly capable of knowing what to do. He's generous, but he's also wise. And so... He might say yes more than you think, but he knows how to say no to, and you can't screw up his will because you asked for the wrong thing. And so, yeah, that's my summary. But anyways, we got a little of the way through Providence there. I think that might be a good place to pick up for our next Theology Craft. Um, so as, as I've been saying, I'm probably going to be cutting back on streaming because I've got a new baby coming, new schedule stuff coming up. But this might sort of become... Maybe my main series is to work on Minecraft projects while doing theology. And then other content on the channel will be uploaded instead of streaming. Um, And so uh, I'm trying to think. Um, uh, Yeah, this might be a Monday thing. I'll let you you guys know if it switches days. But uh, there won't be as much streaming coming up. And this will probably be the main thing. Uh, unless a new game comes out that I want to try. Um, but in terms of uploads, uh, I'm thinking of doing some more like uh, adventure puzzle game walkthroughs that I know the answers to. Um, like I did uh, Firmament, the newer game that came out. And that's that's getting like, it's at like two and a half thousand views at this point. So that was successful, probably because it's a new, newer game. Um, but I might do more Cyan games and some other stuff. And then uh, I might do some reaction videos, you know, as Nintendo or whoever does things. Um, and outside of that, uh, if you're unaware, I have my, uh, theology channel. Uh, I think I have a button for it. Yeah. I think this will send you the link. That should send you a link. Yeah, there you go. There's my theology channel link right there. Um, I'm probably going to be getting back to do, doing content there. I've been on a bit of a hiatus from it because sort of my, uh, partner in crime, one of the elders at my church, he's, he did a, a live podcast with me for a while. 
he had to take a break from that. And now he has even more tough stuff going on in his life right now that he's dealing with. So, uh, he's out of the picture for now, but I want to get back to doing monologues like I used to over there. I have a couple ideas that I might get to. Um, yeah. Uh, got to stream some Starfield in September. Yeah. Yeah. I probably will. I think it's going to be on Xbox game pass. Um, which means I don't even have to buy it. I can just try it. I think. Um, and so, uh, yeah, uh, I, I have been planning on it. That was in my four games. I'm going to try this year, uh, video. And, uh, I've already done the other three. We beat Jedi survivor. We beat, uh, tears of the kingdom and we beat firmament. Um, and so that was the fourth one I listed and we're at least are going to try it. I don't know how much time I'll put into it or if I'll get hooked or not. But that's going to be after I have had my second baby and I'll be very busy <laughs> getting used to a new job and stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, but that's the plan for now. Keep your eyes open on both channels. I do have some plans, but uh, we'll definitely be reformatting the schedule and all that so that I have room. Not sure if it'll be on Game Pass on launch day. Hopefully, though. I thought I heard it was. I might be wrong. If not, uh, maybe I'll buy it. <laughs> so... It was listed, so it's kind of tentatively the plan. So, yep, I'll look into that. I thought I heard it was, but we'll see. In any case, uh, yep, thank you, everybody. And uh, we'll see you around in the next one. Thanks for watching.